When I was about 12 years old, my family and I moved into a semi-detached house just up the street from our previous home. The house wasn't very big, and the floor plans for our part of the house were completely different from our neighbors. Our neighbors were a lovely little family of four. The husband is from England, the wife from Norway, which is where I live. They also had a little three-year-old girl and a six-month-old baby boy. Now, I love children. I always have. And at that time, I really wanted to start babysitting. It's quite common to start babysitting at age 12 here, and I was turning 13 a month later anyway, so I wanted to find some small jobs. As we got to know our neighbors over the first few months of living there, my parents told the neighbors that if they ever needed a sitter, it would be nice if they would consider trying me out. Seeing as it would be my first job as a babysitter, we thought it would be smart to start with the next door neighbors, seeing as my parents would literally be on the other side of the wall if anything happened. Cut to a Friday night when my neighbors went to a party that was happening just down our street. I got there at about 8 p.m. and the parents told me that they would be home between 2 and 3 a.m. Both kids were already asleep, so they told me to just put on a movie and relax. Now, these kids were the easiest kids to babysit ever. Once you put them to bed and they fell asleep, absolutely nothing would wake them up. They are some of the heaviest sleepers I've ever seen, so babysitting them was usually pretty uneventful. I was on the couch watching Avatar in the living room on the second floor. The kids had their own separate bedroom that was just downstairs where the front door was. I could basically see their bedrooms from where I was sitting as the place was quite small. Because of the hallway, I couldn't see the front door. The house was pretty small, so as long as the TV wasn't on too loudly, I could hear everything that was happening downstairs. At about midnight, I heard the front door unlock and my neighbors walked in whilst talking. I heard them close the door and they started taking off their jackets and shoes. I thought it was a little weird that they hadn't called to let me know that they were coming home early, but I assumed it must have just slipped their minds, so I went downstairs to greet them. I could hear them talking up until the point that I came around the corner in the hallway that led to the door. There was nobody there. The talking fell silent the second I turned the corner. The only sound was from the TV upstairs. My heart started beating so fast, and my head was rushing. I ran to the bedrooms and checked the kids before I searched the rest of the house. I opened every door and checked every cabinet for anything that could have explained what just happened, but there was nothing. The kids were sound asleep. Eventually, I convinced myself that I was imagining things. I checked on the kids one last time, just to make sure and their doors were wide open so that I could see them from upstairs. I sat down to finish the movie while trying to process what had just happened, but when I sat down, I noticed that the TV had been shut off, even though I had left it on. When I turned it back on, there was just snow on the screen, and for the life of me, I couldn't get it to work again. That's when the talking downstairs started up again. Not only that, but this time, the baby started screaming bloody murder. This baby never woke up from naps and definitely wouldn't ever scream the way that it did that night. I have never in my life run down a staircase as fast as I did that night. I rushed toward the baby's bedroom, only to find the door closed. I ripped open the door and picked up the baby and rushed to pick up his sister. I took them both upstairs and held those kids for almost three hours before the parents came back home. The talking and sounds from downstairs came and went as I had the kids with me on the couch. I held them as close to me as I could and tried my best to keep them asleep. As the parents came home, I was too scared to walk downstairs to greet them. I couldn't be sure if it was actually them or not until they walked up the stairs and found me clutching their children. Obviously, they noticed I was upset and asked me what had happened. I honestly felt like I had lost my mind at that point, but I told them the story anyway. 
After I was finished, they told me that it wasn't the first time something like that had happened. Apparently, they hear the voices all the time at night. I was kind of surprised that they didn't even think to warn me ahead of time. They said they were sorry that this had happened to me, and the mom walked me home to my house. I slept with the lights on in my room for almost a month after that. Believe it or not, I did go back and I did babysit those kids again. And every once in a while, I would hear the sounds from downstairs. I was off-roading with some buddies back home in eastern New Brunswick, on the Bay of Fundy. There's this trail we go on that ends on the water, and it's at the site of an old ammunition depot from World War II. We've been here many times during the day, and sometimes at night. You can drive into and through this massive old structure, and up the hill is the admin building for this site. It's pretty far into the woods. At the very top of that hill are some grave markers from hundreds of years ago. We were told that they were old private graves. We live on the coast, not at all something that I would doubt being a real thing. We were in there one night in the big building having a fire, and we all saw and heard something quite large scramble up the side of the building and then start running on top of it. Now, there are a dozen of us there, so it's clearly not just one person seeing something crazy. There is nothing in the woods of Eastern Canada that should be able to climb as quickly as what we saw. A black bear? Maybe. But this thing basically ran up the side of a four-story tall structure and then ran across the top of it in moments. Needless to say, we got in our trucks and hightailed it out of there. On another occasion, we were exploring the admin building, which is three stories tall. It's concrete and it's been abandoned since World War II. We go all the way to the top. Nothing weird happens. But as we're coming back, we notice something weird on the second floor. An entire room is filled with lit candles, but there's nobody around whatsoever. We ran out of there so fast. This one, I will admit, could have been an elaborate prank, since lots of people would go and mess around there since it was a fun off-road trail with some history. But the thing that climbed up the building, to this day, that still mystifies me. A few years ago, in the northern part of Sweden, I'm going out for a nice evening of fishing. I'm what I guess is called a fishing supervisor. I check that the other fishermen got their licenses, and I do this at a certain area of lakes and streams. This was in late summer, and I had just been doing my rounds, which I usually end by going to a small lake and fly fishing for some trout. This lake, or pond, is pretty deep in the forest, and I rarely see other people out there. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen someone else out there. This lake looks kind of like a crater. It's a perfectly round circle, perhaps 100 meters in diameter, and it contains a natural population of perch and trout. It was a warm summer evening with a slight breeze. The birds were chirping, and the fish were rising to inspect the spawning insects on the surface. I rig my gear and aim for one of the fish, rising to the right in front of me. At the moment that my fly lands on the surface, it's like somebody pressed the pause button on time. The sun hides behind a cloud. The wind stops blowing. The birds are suddenly silent, and the fish stops eating. 
a smell rises from the ground that I'm standing on. It smells like something dead, something rotten, almost as though I had a carcass buried under my feet. All of a sudden, I'm aware that there's something walking out of the forest behind me, maybe 10 to 15 meters away. It's like I can see it out of the corner of my eye, but still can't see it at the same time. Every hair on my body is on end, and suddenly it's very cold all around me. The thing watching me just stands there, and I don't have the courage to turn around at all. I see my fly sink to the bottom, but I can't move. I can't do anything about it, because I don't dare to move. Then the wind hits me, and it carries the awful smell away. The sun hits me again, a bird is singing somewhere in the forest, and the almost overwhelming feeling of being watched lets go of me. I turn around, and there's nothing there. On the lake, the fish start rising again. I packed my gear and threw the backpack on my back and ran for it. I ran through the forest to my car. I hit the gas and I drove like a maniac until I found the big road and civilization once more. I pulled over to the side of the road and just said to myself, what the heck was that? My heart was still racing. I haven't visited the lake since this happened and I don't know anybody else who has either. So I'm not sure if anybody else has experienced something similar. I've probably visited this place 20 times or more before this happened, and nothing like that had ever happened. The only thing I'm ever really afraid of out there is bears. I do fish at a lot of ponds and lakes that are pretty deep in the forest. There's always a lot of wildlife in these places. Deer, moose, foxes, and the occasional wolf or bobcat, and maybe a bear. I've never been afraid of meeting anybody or any scary person. In fact, other than being cautious about wildlife, I have never really been afraid of anything, except when visiting this particular lake from that point on. I live in northeastern America, in a pretty rural place with lots of hills, not too many neighbors, and a lot of forest. Just tonight, I was headed with my mother down our backyard, which is large and relatively clear for about a hundred feet. Then it switches to woods. We got to about 30 feet before the woods, and I caught sight of some eyes reflecting in my headlamp. They were a good 50 to 100 feet away and I assumed that they belonged to deer. But a few things convinced me that they might not be. Around where I live, deer will run away if you make enough noise. And we were talking pretty loudly, but the eyes weren't moving. They kept staring directly at us, which is incredibly unlike deer in this area. On top of that, the pair of eyes on the right were very low to the ground and very wide set too far apart to be deer, considering the distance. We stood for a minute, remarking on them, and neither pair of eyes looked away. So, since we were spooked, we headed back up to the house, got my brother and a machete, and a bat, and a metal pole. I know, a little overkill, but our area has been a little scary lately. We headed back down, I expected the eyes to be gone by that point. I mean, that's how these things usually go, right? But no, they were still there in slightly different spots than they had been, but not much farther from where they'd been previously. They stared just as steadily as they had before. So we retreated back inside. The logical answer is deer, but the lack of running away, intent staring, and wide set eyes feel like that option is ruled out. Another thought is wild dogs, but we don't really have those in our area. 
It's possible it could have been a black bear, but those are notoriously scared of people. If anyone has thoughts on what this might have been, let me know. Edit. As an update, just to provide more information, there were no visible signs of anything in the area as far as I could tell. The next day I looked for marks on the trees from climbing and saw none. There's a good amount of greenery covering the ground, so it's difficult to look for scat. But there were no signs of any animals having lied down on the ground. We've still been unable to find any evidence that it was something natural. A few months ago, I read a terrifying post about something that happened in the backwoods in Canyon Lake, Texas. I had commented that I nearly threw my phone because I used to live there for a few years. I truly don't know where to begin this story. I moved there my junior year of high school. My family's house was built from the ground up on the south side of the lake. My parents didn't know that this was the side of the lake that most people avoided. I don't mean to be offensive, it's just most of the people that I knew lived on the north side. I never really understood why until the event started happening. The house was finished the summer going into my junior year. When we officially moved in, things were great. A few months into me beginning school is when things turned incredibly dark. It all began when my dad put his guitar in our family room by the fireplace. I would come home and something would string the guitar strings so violently it sounded as if somebody had knocked it over. I began waking up to my dad being completely weirded out because all of our cabinet doors and the doors on the first floor would be open. It escalated dramatically from here. We would hear something in the woods, just outside of the porch lights continually. First, we thought it was an injured animal, but dead deer and other wildlife would appear on our property every few weeks. Then we began to see inhuman things. Guests would see something walking in the hallways, opening drawers, and would see a girl in our guest house. My dad constantly hosted events and parties, including his ex-military friends. They would ask us why we were coming to their rooms at night and opening the drawers and closets and then walking out. My dad didn't believe me until his friends began commenting on figures and people in the house. The worst night was when all the doors began opening and slamming, and it sounded as if somebody was walking up and down the stairs, going into every room, opening and closing the doors. I could go on and on about the things I saw in that house. It was one of the scariest times of my life. All in all, don't go to Canyon Lake. All during my childhood, up until recently, I had thought that ghouls were just spooky, imaginative, scary monsters that would come out on Halloween night. But now, I know differently. I now believe they are synonymous with the creatures we know as crawlers. In Arabic folklore, the ghoul is said to dwell in cemeteries and other uninhabited places. Some say that a ghoul is a desert-dwelling, shape-shifting demon that can assume the guise of an animal. It lures unwary people into the desert or into abandoned places to slay and devour them. The creature also preys on young children, drinks blood, steals coins, and eats the dead. It can also take the form of a human. It is a particularly monstrous character believed to inhabit the wilderness of Afghanistan 
and Iran. The Galu demons were known to be part of the underworld and were thought to carry their victims off to the land of the dead to devour them. People who traveled near cemeteries and abandoned buildings or through desert wastelands were warned to be especially vigilant against these creatures. They were thought to be bipedal, though with a hunched form, and were known to crawl and sometimes run on all four limbs like an animal. I knew there was a reason why I kept warning people to stay away from the forests and surrounding areas. Since we have fewer deserts in the United States, these creatures are frequently encountered in wooded areas in addition to cemeteries. After years of research, I've come to the conclusion that crawlers are actually demons, interdimensional demons. The late great Father Malachi Martin, in his book Hostage to the Devil, stated, quote, There is a dimension that is devoid of love and compassion, all the qualities that make us human, end quote. I believe it is from that dimension which these demon crawlers come. People from the Middle East are far more familiar with the ghouls. They are able to shapeshift and spend time in cemeteries as they feed off the flesh of the dead. Like I said, I used to think these were just stories meant for Halloween and scaring kids. But the more research I do, the more I believe they're real. And I think we all ought to be vigilant. This happened about a year ago in Tucson, Arizona. It was my first time visiting Arizona, and I had no idea how many allegedly haunted places were in the small downtown area of Tucson. It was really exciting for me, as someone who was basically born obsessed with the paranormal and with mysteries in general. I was there with two other females, a friend that I traveled there with and an acquaintance who lived there and was hosting us. It was our first night there, and the woman we were staying with took us out to see the city and have a few drinks. We visited a couple supposedly haunted bars and did a quick round of karaoke before we started walking home. By this time, our host was clearly pretty drunk, but my friend and I were very chill and clear-headed. The house we were staying at was located on the same street, and just a couple of blocks away from the oldest bar in Tucson. It was about 1.30 in the morning. We were talking and laughing, just enjoying the night. The streets weren't empty, but there also weren't many people out. When we turned the corner onto her street, the bar was about two blocks ahead of us and was brightly lit, but the area we were currently in was fairly dark. I was kind of looking down when my friend said, Um, you guys? Don't freak out but there's a guy in a cape walking toward us right now. I looked up and my stomach flipped. There was a man in a thick black hooded cloak heading in our direction. I instantly felt uncomfortable because he was moving with a slow, steady, heavy gait, and he was walking down the very middle of the street, which seemed really odd. As soon as we noticed him, he began moving from the center of the road and veering off toward his left, as if he was intending to come up onto the sidewalk and face us. My heart instantly began racing and I pulled my friend closer to me. We kept walking but slowed down just a little, anticipating his move onto the sidewalk. There were cars lined up along the sidewalk, parked at a diagonal, and the man stepped between two cars in order to reach the sidewalk but he didn't emerge. As we came closer to where he should have been, I was afraid he was going to jump out from between the cars, but he wasn't there at all. He wasn't in any of the cars either. This would have been enough to totally freak me out, but at that moment I looked up and there he was, now nearly 20 feet ahead of us, walking down the very middle of the street again, but this time walking away from us and toward the bar. At this point, I knew something very weird was going on, and I became absolutely fixated on him, like I wanted to study every little nuance of his movement, just trying to process what was even going on. 
I could see his black boots sticking out from the bottom hem of the cloak. It went all the way down to his ankles. I watched how the fabric swayed heavily with his lumbered steps. He looked huge and powerful. He looked just as solid and as real as me or my friends or anyone else. As he drew closer to the bar, he began again veering off toward the sidewalk and the entrance to the bar. The bar was on the same side of the street as us, and we were about one block away by this time. He stepped up onto the sidewalk and headed directly for the entrance. At this point, two women walked out of the bar and walked right past him. I mean, should have brushed up against him or ran into him, but never even acknowledged his presence. They then stood outside just a foot or two away from him, talking and flipping their hair, never even glancing back once. They definitely did not see him. At this same instant, I noticed that he had stopped at the entrance to the bar. There's a really big, super bright sign just about the entrance that glows the name of the bar, so he was perfectly illuminated now. With him standing there, I had a clear perspective of his height. He was taller than the top of the door. The tip of his hood was only a few inches below the bottom of the lit-up sign. He had his head slightly down, and I noticed that his feet seemed to be stuck mid-step. It was the strangest thing. It was almost like looking at a computer glitch. One foot was in front of the other, slightly raised up with the heel touching the ground, but he was just rocking back and forth like he was stuck in the motion of taking the step. Then our drunk friend, who had noticed none of this, said something, and I glanced in her direction. When I looked back at him a millisecond later, he was gone. We even went into the bar and he was nowhere there, and there's nowhere he could have gone. They had CCTV cameras with the videos being displayed right there above the bar, but I was too shy to ask if they could check for footage. This experience has absolutely haunted me ever since. His presence didn't necessarily feel scary, although I was afraid right at first when I thought he was some creepy dude wandering the streets in a cape, but when I realized he wasn't human, I felt calm and almost comforted by his energy. I couldn't stop talking about it afterward and wondering what it was we saw. We passed by that bar several more times over the rest of our stay, and each time there was a person just standing there leaning up against a pole outside the bar who either followed us for a block or tried to talk to us, and it just seemed odd. My friend strangely began kind of seeming to detach herself from me as the days progressed. We were roommates at the time, and when we got home from the trip, she dropped me off at our apartment and went straight to her boyfriend's house. I didn't see or hear from her for almost a week. It really felt like she was trying to avoid me. I started spiraling into a deep depression. Within four months, our friendship had completely deteriorated in the worst way. We ended up moving out of the apartment that summer and were no longer friends at all. Although there are clear circumstances that led to this and I take responsibility for my role in the friendship breakup, I always wonder if that encounter in Arizona influenced any of it to happen, because when I look back it really seemed like there was some kind of turning point in the way she felt toward me after that. Just to be clear, ever since we stopped being friends, my life has been richer and more joyous and more fulfilling than ever. All these things in my life practically rearranged themselves when she and I began fighting, and now I'm genuinely happier, and I feel more loved and supported than I ever have. Whether or not that cloaked entity had anything to do with it, I'm very grateful to have had that experience. It's the most potent, paranormal, and mysterious experience I've had to date. I'm wondering if anyone else has ever seen anything like this before, or had their lives dramatically changed after encountering the other side. I live in northern Alabama. I was out rock hounding solo today to a place that my husband and I have gone before. Everything seemed normal when I arrived. It's a very secluded area of the creek with a rock bar in the middle of the creek and with a small patch of woods to the left and a dense forest on the right. 
I crossed the creek and set up my gear on the rock bar, grabbed a bag, and started walking up the creek. About 45 minutes in, I kept looking up at the forest. I don't know why, but I just kept getting an eerie feeling. Every now and then, I'd hear a couple of thumps out there, but you know, nature, so I didn't think anything of it. About an hour in, I heard my first meow. I was so focused on pulling clay that I literally stood up and was like, I did not just hear a cat meow, did I? 10 minutes go by and I'm walking farther up the creek and damn it if I didn't hear it again. I stopped and was like, yep, I just heard a cat meow. How strange. Something really did seem off though and I started to feel uneasy, so much so that I turned around and headed back to my site. Something about the meow just wasn't right. Wasn't a painful meow, but just a matter of fact meow, if that makes sense. About five minutes into the trek back, I definitely heard a cat meow. I'm sweating like crazy because of the heat, but instantly I feel cold, clammy, and the hair is standing up on the back of my neck. I know what I was supposed to be hearing, a single meow, but it wasn't coming from a cat. It sounded like someone or something was imitating a cat. I keep focused on getting back to my sight and about five minutes later, I hear another single meow. Here's where I realize that things are getting really strange. The meow always sounded the exact same distance from me, no matter how far I kept walking. I finally reached my site and pulled out my drinks and plopped down to rehydrate. That's when another meow sounded, and this time I knew with everything in me that it was not a cat that was following me. I calmly gathered up my gear and started to trek across the creek to the path to my car. There was another long meow. I made my way across the creek and hunched down in a pit. I parked my car right next to the edge of the forest and I was really starting to lose my mind. I get my keys and mace out and I put my gear on me so that I can dive into my car and rearrange later. And that's exactly what I did. I nearly crapped myself finding the courage to make it to my car, but I did and I hightailed it out of there, fast. I know that the rational answer is that somebody was out there messing with me, but how did they get back there and why? It's like 200 acres of forest. People don't go back there all that often. I'd have to believe that somebody went back there sat around and waited for somebody to mess with. And how did they follow me without me hearing a crunch or anything? To this day, I can't explain what in the world happened that day, but something was off. This took place in a small city in Alaska where I grew up. One night at approximately 12 a.m. to 2 a.m., I was lying awake. I'm a very light sleeper and I often have trouble falling asleep. At about that time, I started hearing what sounded like an obnoxious mix of possibly a clarinet or a trumpet playing loud screeches. No harmony just squeaks and honks in the cold night air. I sat for a while on my bed. I couldn't sleep. It was loud enough for me to hear inside. I went out the front door and stood on the porch and just listened. It sounded like whoever was playing it was a few blocks away, but at the same time, it was as though you could hear it in every direction. It was autumn and very cold at the time, I was so frustrated by the screeching in the late hour that I actually yelled out, shut up, thinking it was a kid playing a prank. 
About a year or two later, when I had nearly forgotten about it, I heard the sound again, this time in the daytime in the winter air. It lasted for a few hours and then quit. It wasn't until probably five years after this that I watched a video on YouTube called Trumpets in the Sky about people around the world hearing the exact same noises and not being able to find any explanation for them. It literally gave me the chills. But now it has me wondering, has anyone else experienced the same thing? So, I was a wildland firefighter back in the day, in Arizona. I worked in a forest that was generally popular with a lot of recreation in the northern portion, but I worked in the southern portion of the forest, which was really remote. It barely had any roads or campgrounds, so if you wanted to recreate there, you had to work for it. The fire crew I was on only had two duty stations, one in a small town where the rest of the forest employees worked out of, and one that was about two and a half hours away up a really windy mountainous road. The remote duty station had an old forest service ranger station and a newer double wide trailer that was recently put in. When I worked at this place, it had no cell reception. When my crew and I weren't working, we were playing horseshoes and watching movies. They did eventually add a cell phone booster, which sadly just made people play on their phones, but I digress. So as for the creepy story, I want to keep it pretty simple. But my supervisor from that crew had experienced some odd things working up there as well. There was one night that he told me he was cowboy camping, which if you don't know means sleeping outside without a tent. And he kept getting a weird mucusy drop of liquid on his face. He kept looking around, even yelling, but nobody was there. He told me that he wasn't below any trees, so he's sure that it wasn't sap. He never slept outside there ever again which leads me to believe he was telling me the truth. As for my story, I have had other interesting experiences at that remote duty station, but this one was scary. It was the night of July 4th and we weren't on a fire, so the crew was playing horseshoes and having a good time. Everyone went to bed pretty early because we were going to have a PT hike the next day. I had my own small room in the double wide trailer and my bed was situated next to a big window. I started dozing off, but felt awake still. That's when I hear one of my coworkers outside my window asking me to come outside. I was laying on my side facing the window and I didn't look up, but I felt their presence there. It felt as though something tall was looming over me from outside. They kept beckoning me, and I said no. Pretty quickly, their voice began to change to a deeper, raspier, angrier voice. They started cursing at me. Get the F outside. I just froze. It was sort of a demonic voice, not my coworkers anymore. I lay frozen, not moving while they yelled at me. Eventually, it stopped and I fell asleep. I woke up the next day and I wanted to ask my coworker if he was standing outside my window, but it felt a little bit too weird. Perhaps this was a mild form of sleep paralysis, but whatever it was, it was really creepy. I'm a 
a scout leader in Ireland, and my friend group are all outdoorsy people, so I've done my fair share of outdoor adventures. One time, we were away, camping down on a site in Roscommon. There were about four of us in a dome tent that night, and each one of us heard rustling and moving around outside our tent during the night. We were all scared shitless and didn't mention it to each other, until the next morning over breakfast with the others from our group. It wasn't until then that the two others in the other tents spoke up about hearing rustling right outside of their tents as well, and something rubbing along their tent wall. Well, we were all convinced that it had to be a wild animal, since there were no other people on our site. We had two nights left. It wasn't our first or our last time there. We've stayed there roughly around 15 times, give or take. And while I believe there are wild deer around, I've never seen them in person. Not once. There are always people down there on the site where we stay. So surely, wild animals would stay clear of that area and wouldn't come right up to the tent walls. Right? Another time, while wild camping near Glendalow, several of us in a tent woke up several times to the sound of the zipper on our tent door. It wasn't just a small zipper noise. It was as if the exterior door were being fully zipped open or closed. There were two tents, so two groups, but we all decided to kip in together because of how cold it was. So it was nobody from our group joking with us. It could easily have been another group but while wild camping, the chances of another person or group being close to you are slim. Once we looked around and knew that the door, to our knowledge, hadn't been zipped, and that we weren't in immediate danger, we chose to ignore it. It happened a few times that night. You kind of learn, while camping, to ignore weird noises and movements outdoors, most nights spent camping, you don't get much sleep, really. You're always conscious of being in the wilderness and so exposed. It might not be the creepiest of stories. Most of our weird camping or hiking experiences have happened abroad, to be fair. But all the same, it still hasn't put us off camping or being outdoors. Even if we can't be sure what's out there. So this happened relatively recently. My friends and I were living at a cabin in Lake Tahoe in California. It was in May, so not snowing, but the nights got down to near freezing temperatures. We had gotten some firewood burning in the fireplace and the three of us were chilling around it. We were drinking scotch and had turned down all the lights all the way down in the cabin. The nearby houses were about 300 yards out and they had their lights down as well. We heard creaking on our roof for two to three seconds, which stopped. That was followed by what sounded like a bag or something mildly heavy dropping on the roof. Then it was followed by the scariest, heaviest rumble any of us had ever heard. The entire roof shook, but nothing else in the house did. So we knew it wasn't an earthquake. We almost felt like something broke the roof and was coming down the stairs to get us. We screamed and picked up the hot fire pokers and searched through the cabin, tapping walls and the attic area. We looked up the chimney for raccoons as they tend to hide there. Also, this wasn't the first night we had had the fire. If a raccoon mama was nesting, she would have fell through the chimney. We found nothing. We saw our neighboring house turn on their lights and they came out with searchlights. 
They had heard a similar sound. We all thought a bear had run from our roof to theirs, but it's unusual for a bear to do that. The neighbor's dog was quiet through it all. I checked that there was no way out from the chimney besides up, so if something was in there, it couldn't have escaped the roof without popping the lid, which was intact. We don't know what it was. For the next two nights, we had a fire up. Nothing. Not sure what it was, and perhaps I'll never know. My friend and I were hiking in Blue Ridge, Georgia. We were just going camping for one day, and the trail was part of the Appalachian Trail, near the very start of it. My friend told me a story about one of his friends and said that he heard voices and footsteps at night near Blood Mountain. He said that he had to night hike because the noises were so intense. We found a campsite and we set up shop. As it got darker, we got a bad feeling, like something was watching us. And then it started. We saw a pair of red glowing eyes about 100 to 150 feet away from our fire. Then my friend goes to dunk his head in the creek near our tent and he explains that something pushed him into the water. His shirt was soaked and he hit his nose on a rock and was bleeding. After that, we heard a woman's voice. He was speaking, but we couldn't really make out the words. We heard it in front of us, behind us, and to the left of us over the creek. It could have been a hiker, but to the left, there was no trail. And if it was somebody night hiking, they weren't using a flashlight. We also heard footsteps around us and sticks snapping. Finally, we just got in the tent and tried to sleep. My friend fell asleep before I did, and I heard twigs snapping right next to my head outside of the tent. That was pretty much our entire night, but it was very, very creepy. If you decide to go camping in Blue Ridge, just know there are things out there lurking in the night. It might seem stupid, but this sound has bugged me since the day I first heard it back in May. I could swear that I've never heard anything like this. I went with my dog in a pretty offhand natural reserve in Italy for a walk. This one is a particular reserve. It's not like a park. It's wild and no human activity is allowed, except for monitoring and hiking in specific days of the month. It's because it's the habitat of a very rare bird, but I can't remember which one. This means that I was basically alone with my dog, but still, it was a super sunny day and the place isn't dangerous at all. No slopes, no hard paths, only a very big river. And if you avoid getting super close to it, you'll have no problems with it. Everything was great until lunch. While eating, out of nowhere, I started to hear this very strange noise coming from multiple directions in the woods. Now, it was super weird since I've read all the info of the reserve and it says that whenever they make monitoring operations, they deny access and I was pretty sure that I was the only person there. This place only has one entrance and it's totally surrounded by a swamp. There are no cars except for mine and not a soul out there. 
The closest structure is about 25 kilometers away from that place. My dog started to bark and became so nervous that I had to calm her down for a while. Something like this has never happened before. My dog, a lab, has heard many noises in the woods, even louder than this one, but has never gotten nervous. I'll try to explain what the sound was like. The best way I can describe it is that it was like a loud metallic bang, like when you hit a stick against a metallic can, immediately followed by the sound of an engine failing, like when you try to start an old tractor and it won't. It occurred three or four times per minute and lasted about seven to eight seconds each time. The noise made my dog and I very uneasy. I don't know why. I'm used to hiking in the woods, even at night. And in my life, I've heard much scarier sounds, like thunder and lightning striking close to the ground, very close to my house. But this one was somehow dreadful. It made me and my dog freak out. So I decided to pack everything up, head back to the car, and leave the area as soon as possible. The noise never stopped. It continued to occur in the same way I described it. And there's another weird thing. It always sounded very close. No matter where I went or how far I parked my car, around an hour of hiking from the spot I first heard it, it always sounded like it was the same distance away, like it was following us, maintaining about 30 meters of distance. My dog calmed down and fell asleep only when we were in the car and halfway back home. I felt super tired too, as soon as I calmed down, and I barely managed the drive to my home, trying not to fall asleep the whole way. That evening, I had a massive headache and felt very off. So I immediately drifted to bed. In your opinion, what was that? I didn't cross anyone to ask them on the reserve or at the office. It was closed that day. Nobody has ever been able to tell me what produced that noise. Plus, as I said, the reserve is super close to a river and a swamp. Maybe those things are connected. What do you think? Before I get into my story, I'd like to give a little background about my dog growing up. His name was Fonzie because he had long black hair with a white patch on his chest. Growing up, he was my best friend and protector. He was a mix of Chow and German Shepherd. And if you've ever met a Chow, I'm sure you're well aware that once they imprint on you, they won't accept anyone but you. And they are fearless protectors which was just multiplied with the mix of German Shepherd. When I was eight, we lived in the foothills of Mount Baker in the Pacific Northwest. It was a not so populated area. One evening around dusk outside my house, Fonzie and I were up to our usual shenanigans. He would sit behind me as I shot my BB gun at some targets I had set up on the tree line. All of a sudden, he moved in front of me and started growling, which only happened when he felt that I was in danger. Right after he got between the tree line and me, about 20 feet, a very deep and loud, almost clicking sound came from the trees. Limbs were breaking and you could hear the ground pounding. We were both terrified. He started whimpering, which he never did. We both ran into the house. I looked out the window to see if whatever it was had come out of the woods, but nothing emerged. I told my dad about it, but he didn't believe me. He jokingly said, oh yeah, it was probably Bigfoot. But I've never heard of any Bigfoot story where it charged someone. Black bears tend to stay away from loud dogs, and it was way too loud to be a cougar. So that's my story. It was by far the most terrifying experience of my life, and it still haunts me to this day as a 31-year-old man.
Last year, I was backpacking deep in the mountains in Montana. I was near Libby, Montana, about three hours west of Glacier National Park. I was hiking alone, and I expected to encounter bears, moose, etc. I'm experienced, and I know how to handle them, so I wasn't scared. But this time, I was way out in the middle of nowhere, with nobody around for miles. Also, no cell service anywhere, and I didn't have my emergency beacon with me. Usually, I expect to see other hikers on the trail, but not here. Nope. I was out there completely alone, and I knew it. Well, it was like nine miles to my camp up at Cedar Lake. About halfway, the trail opened up, and I was in a somewhat clear area and had better visibility of what was around me. There were still trees and green undergrowth covering the ground. A few minutes later, I see something quickly scurry across the trail, maybe 50 feet in front of me. I stopped, froze, and waited. The creature noticed me and then stood up in the undergrowth, but still almost completely covered by the tall grass and shrubs. It was about three feet tall, pitch black, 50 to 60 pounds, and obviously very quick and intelligent. I assumed it was a baby black bear at first, so I didn't move or make a sound, and I got my bear spray ready, fully expecting an angry mama bear to come roaring out of the trees at me. But thankfully, that didn't happen, because I surely would have been attacked or at least bluff charged. All I could see was its face through the tall grass. The creature stared at me invasively for about 30 seconds. I was staring back at it. I didn't move a muscle. Then, suddenly, it huffed loudly at me and then ran through the grass up the side of the hill and I never saw it again. The sound it made was a lot deeper than you would expect from something that small. It was like a bear's growl. You could almost feel it inside your chest. Very unsettling. I stood there silently and waited for another few minutes to see if Mama Bear was nearby and that it was indeed a cub, but nothing came. I gingerly passed through that area on the trail and kept hiking. My research tells me it may have been an otter or a mink, but I've seen them before, and this wasn't like anything I've seen before. It was the way it moved. I only saw it for a second, but it almost slithered on the ground like a reptile and then stood up on its hind legs and watched me, making me feel really uncomfortable. There was something sinister about it. I checked for tracks, but couldn't find any. I have no idea what that thing was. So I used to live near an infamous road. It's a thin road with no street lines, has only a few houses at the end, and is lined with thick woods. There were no street lights. We heard stories like ghosts being spotted in the woods, weird beasts, creepy vibes, and a penny thrown off a small bridge coming back to you. Things like that. Urban legends, really. My boyfriend and I decided to drive down it one night in his car. It was a small stick shift car. The road had several pull-offs where you could park and sit. We pulled off at the first one and took some footage of the woods. Nothing happened. So we continued driving to the next pull-off. We parked and shut off the car. We heard some rustling, but we both assume that it's an animal moving away from the sound of the car parking. We sat there for a few seconds in the dark of the woods. We heard something hit the car like a rock or something. Then we heard several pounds on the truck and the roof. At this point, we decided to drive off. He attempted to start the car to no avail. He tried this several times before it eventually did start. He then put it in gear and stepped on the gas, but the car stood still. I was freaking out and told him to stop messing around. He said he wasn't. Then the car, while in first gear and the gas was depressed, began to be pulled backwards. Against all logic, the car was fighting to go forward against something that wasn't visible. 
The taillights lit up the forest behind us, and there was absolutely nothing there. Out of nowhere, the car miraculously just jumps forward, and we drove away from the pull-off. Blown away by this experience, we decided to find another pull-off. This was stupid. The one we found was before the bridge where pennies are thrown. We go over to the bridge and throw a penny. We hear it hit the small stream. We look back at the car and we swear that we see somebody walk behind it. So we rush back to the car, but there's no sign of anyone. This was the last straw, so we decided to get off that road ASAP. We get in the car and we speed off. As we're driving, something small hits and chips our windshield. It did not sound like a rock. It sounded like a penny. Whatever was on that road wanted us gone, and we haven't gone back since. I was a child of divorce and, as such, was often taken by my dad on weekends when I was a kid. He spent most of that time waxing his car at my grandparents who lived out in nowhere North Carolina since he lived in a condo with no hoses to wash his precious. Ignored, my brother and I were typically left to our own devices and wandered the fields and woods around my granddad's land, which was about a half hour drive from civilization. My family owned the neighboring homes and great swatches of land between and behind the homes, so we could pretty much explore out there for hours. All this said, there were some really disturbing things that happened there, and I personally think they're either too absurd or too subtle to have been my childhood imagination. You can decide for yourselves, though, and I'd love to hear what you guys think might have been going on. Here are some things I remember. My great uncle was the kind of a jack of all trades. He bought and sold used cars. He also bought wrecks to strip and scrap, dumping the useless husks in a field and the woods up a trail behind his house. My brother and I called this place the car graveyard. On its own, it was eerie, with cars all the way back from the 50s in various states of disrepair. I used to climb inside them until I got into one that was tacky with what might have been dried blood. Sometimes I'd find bones out there, deer mostly, but they'd be in odd places, like skulls on car hoods. My guess is that it was just poachers on his land messing around because he didn't hunt, but who knows. I never saw any with skin or fur. One day, my brother and I were going to the car graveyard, but up the trail to it, we started to hear what sounded like pained moaning up ahead, where the derelicts were. We turned tail that day. Oddest, perhaps, from the car graveyard was the one time we actually went really far back to see just how deep the cars went. It continued into the woods for a while, with trees sometimes growing right out of the wrecks. My brother and I saw something ahead that looked like fog or mist, which reminds me of another story, but that's for another day. We didn't think much about it because we were kids, but this was mid-afternoon and the mist was only in one area. We passed on through and felt inexplicably weird and decided to give up on seeing just how far back it went. When we got back to my granddad's place, things seemed off. It was really hard to explain. My dad looked like my dad and acted like him, but he didn't feel the same. My brother felt this same dissonance too, and we got this wild idea that when we crossed the fog, we somehow stepped into another dimension, maybe just slightly different from our own. Maybe it was just stupid kid stuff, but I still remember how oppressive this feeling of not belonging was. We booked it back across the fog again, and when we came back, everything immediately felt as right as rain. We went back as an adult to that same spot, no fog, but there was a particularly off-putting sensation. A few other odd things happened out there, but not in the car graveyard. We heard laughter coming from a hole in the woods. I swore that I saw the stereotypical sheet ghost near the woods, but as soon as I looked, they vanished. I regularly saw a face in the shadows between the trees across the field. 
It reminded me of Morlock from the 60s time machine. I saw a log truck carrying a bear on its back that was as tall as a house. It was probably some fiberglass thing for a store or putt-putt golf, but it was still a really odd thing to see. I hesitate to add this one because it's just so goofy, but what the heck. One day my brother and I were messing with my granddad's walkie-talkies and we saw this really odd looking bird in the sky. We joked that it looked like a flying monkey from the Wizard of Oz and said, flying monkey, flying monkey, come in flying monkey, into the walkie-talkies. Another voice came through and said, someone get me a flying banana. A bit spooked, we went into the kitchen and took a banana to leave it outside, and we stayed indoors for the rest of that visit. When we left, only the peel was sitting outside. That's about all I got for that area. A few things happened inside the house too, but that's not really pertinent to this story. This creepy encounter occurred in the fall of 2001. My family lived in a nice house in the middle of some dense woods. A few of my friends consistently brought their four-wheelers with them when they came to spend the night. We had a huge yellow four-wheeler and rode pretty much constantly that year. The woods behind my parents' house had trails, every which way, that snaked around and down the haulers and to the roads. My friends and I, 11 to 12 years old at the time, had these big plans to get street signs and put them on the trees so that all of our trails would have their names proudly displayed. One day, a friend came to stay and we rode around on the trails for hours. When we became bored of the trails, we took off on the main road to a fire training center about three miles away. The fire training center was down a one-lane gravel road with trees butting up to the side so close that a car would get scratched going down it. At the end of the road was a pole gate to keep people like us out. On the way there, we passed by a small pickup truck with two men in it. When we got to the little trail that went down and around the gate, we saw a dead dog wrapped up in a blanket, blocking the path. We decided to turn around because I didn't want to run over the thing. So we started heading back on the main road, and again, about halfway back, we passed the small pickup truck with the men. My friend and I joke that the men are following us because they know we saw the dog that they dropped off and that they hadn't buried it the way they should have. We get almost back to my house and decide we can probably find another trail around the dog, maybe on the other side of the gate. So off we go. We turn on to the little gravel road and go to the end. There is no other trail, no other way around, but the dog is kind of laying on half of the blanket. So we sit there for a few minutes while I try to convince my friend if she just tugs on the edge of the blanket, we could move the blanket and the dog out of the way without actually touching or disturbing it. She's not budging, but I really want to ride on the other side of the gate. After a few minutes, it's clear that she is not touching the blanket so we turn around to head back home. We start back down the gravel road and after a second, we turn to the straight part. Panic set in quickly. The small pickup is sitting in the road, blocking our only exit. The trees touch both sides of the truck, so there's no going around it. Two large men sit staring at us. After what feels like forever, I whip the four-wheeler around and go through the trail anyway. We get around the gate into safety. Were they watching me try to persuade her to move the blanket? Could they see us the whole time? Were they still moving until we got to the clear part? What would have happened if I hadn't given up on the blanket? Those questions scare me now as much as they did back then. That gravel road only goes to the fire training center, which is blocked off by a large metal gate. A car that pulls down there is only able to back the entire way out onto the main road. Anyway, we soon forgot about it, and it really didn't change much. I like to think that our town is really safe, and that the men were just curious about what the heck we were doing going back and forth. 
But when I read some stories, I think about what it could have been, how it could have gone differently, and it really freaks me out. When I was 13, I babysat a little girl named Emma, one of the sweetest kids you could think of. I was a regular babysitter for her, so much so that when I couldn't babysit for a few months, she called all her other babysitters by my name. This happened after I came back to being a regular babysitter for her. It was about 10.30 at night. I had already put Emma to bed and had been channel surfing. The house was set up so that the front half was open concept. The living room, dining room, and kitchen were side by side. In between the living room and dining room was an open doorway to the back half of the house. At one end was Emma's room, and the other end had her parents, with the bathroom connected to the parents' room. While I was sitting on the couch, I heard something run down the hall to the bathroom. Assuming it was just Emma going to the bathroom, I let it be. A few minutes went by, and I heard the feet heading back down the hall. I turned to tell her to go back and make sure she flushed, because I hadn't heard it, but I only saw the tips of black hair that ran past the open doorway. Here's the problem. Emma is blonde. I quickly jumped up and rushed to Emma's bedroom, throwing open the door. Her nightlight was bright enough to make her out as she sat up and looked at me, rubbing her eyes in confusion. I asked her if she had just gone to the bathroom. When she shook her head, I did a once-over of her room, checking under her bed and a quick peek in her closet. I didn't see anything, so I told Emma I was just double-checking for monsters. I tucked Emma back in, saying goodnight, and as I headed out of her room, leaving the door slightly open, I stopped when I heard her speak. I thought she was going to call me back in and ask me something. But instead, I hear her say, You should have said something. Don't scare her. I really like her. I didn't say anything to the mom about it, and I continued to babysit Emma. Or I did until they moved away. I always made an effort after that to include the second child I didn't know I was babysitting. If Emma was drawing, an extra spot was set up. If she was eating, another chair and table setting was set up. It seemed to make Emma happy, and nothing ever startled me again. Still, weirds me out. I am a 27-year-old female and I went backpacking alone over the recent long weekend, which was 10 out of 10 beautiful. The second night I camped at a beautiful high elevation lake, which could also be accessed by a short one mile trail. So there were a few other campers and several people who were just day hiking or fishing. It was late afternoon and I was sitting around my camp reading when a guy in his mid twenties walked by carrying a fishing pole and a small cooler. I didn't think much of it. But five to ten minutes later, he doubled back and came and said hello. I said, hi, and went back to reading. But then, without warning, he sat down on a stump next to me. I was completely taken aback at this invasion of my space. He started asking me questions that were really just statements, but in a creepy, amused tone. Like, so, you're just reading? and then looked behind me and noticed my tent and said, Oh, you're staying the night here alone, huh? I didn't say anything in response to this in particular, but it was obvious that I was. It's hard to explain, but his vibe was just really off. I was so uncomfortable that I couldn't even really form words or tell him that I was trying to be alone and get him to leave me alone. I was honestly paralyzed. His eyes were so dead and dark, and they just drilled into me. I just responded with things like, uh-huh, or yep, 
or something like that, and tried to pretend that I was still reading. Without warning, he pulls out and cracks open a beer and lights a cigarette and just starts blowing the smoke at me. At this point, I am so uncomfortable and just not responding. Soon, another hiker wandered by and he strikes up a conversation with him and I took the opportunity to grab my water filter and bladder and pretend that I needed to get water. I went to the shore and filtered some water super slowly and I saw him walk away to go sit with the new guy, which made me pretty relieved, except that he kept looking in my direction. I came back eventually and got inside my tent and for about 20 minutes, everything was fine. I had the rain fly pulled back and was just watching the sunset and loosely organizing my things. When he popped out from behind my tent and stood maybe one foot from my door, looking down at me. He didn't say anything, but he just started laughing this really creepily fake laugh. I said, what? And his response was, this is just really funny. I literally felt sick to my stomach and I finally responded with something like, I'm taking a nap now, so you have a good night. He laughed again, but luckily he left. Later, I saw him still wandering around the camp with no real purpose, still looking in my direction often. I had no service, but I wrote down his last name, at least what was written on his cooler, and where he said he was from while talking to the other hiker in my notes app just in case, and I slept with my pocket knife close. I debated leaving camp that night, but I ended up staying and just leaving super early in the morning, in case he came back. Normally while backpacking, I think the worst thing that could happen is that I might run into a bear or sprain an ankle, and maybe this seems not as bad as you're reading this. But in the moment, face to face, this truly was the most unsettling experience I've ever had in the backcountry. I'm sure I'll be back out soon, but hopefully somewhere far away from this dude. My friend Monica has been babysitting for this family for the past two years. She has been taking care of these two girls, both at the age of two. Nothing out of the ordinary has happened in the past, but recently there have been some strange events taking place. One normal day, Monica was just doing her thing, putting the babies to sleep in their own separate rooms, all cribbed up for nap time. After making sure that the girls were asleep, she left the room at about 1.30. A couple of hours later, at 3 in the afternoon, she went to check on the girls. What she found in one of the girls' rooms was very unsettling. The room was a mess. Ripped up diapers and napkins were strewn everywhere. The kiddo was fast asleep as if nothing had ever happened. Above one of the shelves in the room, across from the girls' crib, hung a cross in a sealed box that the family had gotten from the Vatican. They were very specific in telling her to never open the box or touch the crucifix. She immediately noticed that the box was open and the crucifix was on the floor. Mind you, the crucifix had been hung three meters off the ground, much too high for the baby to reach. She also found some angel deck cards on the ground, each attributed to a different saint or angel. She quickly woke up the child and made sure she was all right and unharmed. Then comes the strangest part of the story. After waking her up, she took her into the other room for playtime. Then, playing pretend restaurant, the little girl approached Monica holding a piece of paper in her hand, which Monica assumed was the pretend menu for the restaurant. But when Monica took it out of her hand, she noticed that it was a pamphlet to do with the Wiccan religion and basic instructions for how to practice witchcraft. Monica, now obviously on edge, asks the little girl where she'd gotten it from. The girl pointed toward a book laid open on one of the stairs, 
which was unusual because she knows not to play with the books from the bookshelf and is normally very well behaved. The book was Wicca, A Guide for the Solitary Practitioner by Scott Cunningham. Ever since then, Monica has been a little on edge, and she said that she's been having very strange and abnormal dreams. Some other important information to note is that the family is Catholic, and they live across the street from Eastern State Penitentiary, an old suspected haunted former prison that closed in 1971. If you have any ideas, speculations, or know anything that has to do with Wicca or the book mentioned, please let me know. Monica wants to know the best ways to keep herself and the baby safe from whatever energy is in the house because regardless of anything else, she feels that they are definitely not friendly. As we speak, I am babysitting two little girls in an old New England manor. The two girls are upstairs in bed, and I have both baby monitors. The oldest is already asleep. The youngest is whispering. I hear her say, what? Why? Why? And then I hear, always turns back into the dog. Pretty sure the dog is laying at my feet. Somebody come keep me company. Update. The parents finally came home. I was called pretty unexpectedly to come babysit, which is unusual for this usually very well-planned family. They were in a rush to leave and told me it would only be for a couple of hours. It turned out to be five. That made me nervous right there. They returned saying that they were in a rush because the dad had been bitten on the chest and they needed to go to the hospital without stressing anybody out. Doctors were unsure and gave him antibiotics. Earlier today, the microwave went on the fritz and started melting everything on the outside of the microwave. They had me check on it all night. Now that I'm seriously thinking about all of these things, I wonder if they all add up to something or if I'm just paranoid. In January, when I babysat them last, I fell at the bottom of the stairs. I stood up and I fell again and sprained my ankle pretty badly. I chalked it up to black ice. But of course, now I'm second guessing that too. There was blood spattered on the youngest girl's bed sheets. She said she had three nosebleeds in one week. Maybe this could all be unrelated, but I'm starting to think that something pretty malicious is going on there. But what do I know? I'm just the babysitter. Last summer, my family of four and I were backpacking and camping near a river. It was a remote canyon in a very wild area, and it was quite blissful, until we woke up around two o'clock in the morning to a very distressing sound. We were sleeping in our hammocks very close to the river, and about 40 feet behind us was a tall canyon wall. The sound made me think of an injured animal that was very cat-like. It was coming from behind us toward the wall of the canyon. It was regular. It occurred like clockwork every 15 to 20 seconds. We thought this was unusual. We shined flashlights and spoke very loudly in hopes of frightening whatever it was away from us. There was no moon out and we could see very little but shining our flashlights around revealed nothing as well. Still, it sounded so very close. Our efforts did not work at all, and it seemed relentless and completely unfazed by us in every way. I worried that it was rabid or hurt. At one point, I heard it near the river, on the other side of us, and I was incredibly confused as to how it was able to move around without us hearing it. I sat on the edge of my hammock until dawn, with my knife in my hand, waiting for a wild or sick animal to come out of the bushes at any moment, 
and having to fight for our lives. Fortunately, that didn't happen. Finally, around dawn, the sounds got less frequent, and eventually they stopped. After hiking out, we googled many different animal sounds. The closest we could find to what we had heard was a mountain lion mating call. There definitely were lions in that area, so I still believe that that's what we heard. I'm still really confused, though, as to why it stayed so very close to us, and why it wasn't scared away like most animals would be. I'm also confused as to how it got from one side to the other without us detecting it. We've seen black bear in this area many times, and they've always run in the other direction when seeing humans, and cats are even more elusive. So, regardless of what happened, it was very strange behavior, and it still gives me the creeps to this day. This is a story that happened to me years ago that I have never really talked much about. I thought it might be interesting to tell, though. When I was a teenager, I made money by babysitting. On this particular night, I was working at a house a few minutes away from my home, so I had been able to work later than usual. The family had two little girls that I was watching, around four and seven years old. To give a bit of background on what the home looked like, the house had two floors and two staircases that led to the upstairs. One set was off the kitchen and the other was in the foyer. This home had an alarm system that would beep three times when any door was opened, although it was not the type that would say which door. I was sitting in the kitchen at around 11 p.m. and just coloring to pass the time at the kids' table. The parents had said that they would be home between 11.30 and 12. I was starting to get antsy to go home. It was nearing midnight when I heard the alarm for the door, and I got up, expecting to see the parents coming in. When they didn't, I just went back to what I was doing. About 15 minutes later, it went off again. This time, I felt a little creeped out, so I went around checking all the doors which I found to be shut tight and locked. I had sat back down, figuring that there must be some kind of glitch with the system. Within about a minute, the door alarm went off twice, as if two doors had been opened in quick succession. And as I stood up, I heard a little girl screaming bloody murder. I raced up the stairs into the girl's shared room and found them both sleeping soundly. I checked all the nooks and crannies of their room, and I remember feeling that the only thing that seemed different was that the book that I had read them was on the floor instead of in the bookshelf. I ended up checking the stairs and the other rooms, as I felt pretty unsure of the girl's safety, but I found nothing, and all the doors were still locked. I ended up sitting back down in the kitchen, feeling stupid, and not long after, the alarm beeped once, really loudly, which I had not heard before, and the panel did not seem to give an explanation for that. After that, everything stopped, and the parents came home not long after. I managed to convince myself at the time that I had just imagined things, but after all this time, I can still remember the fearful scream really clearly. Nothing too exciting, I guess. Just something that I have never been able to forget. I'm going to give a little background first before I get into my experience, so you can all better understand. My partner and I are good friends with another couple that we often go over to hang out with. We'll call them Ashley and David. We go to their house about twice a week, and nothing out of the ordinary ever happens. We usually just hang out and talk for hours, with a few beers. 
David has mentioned a few times that he's seen Ashley's deceased brother around the house. Ashley always rolls her eyes and says she doesn't believe in things like that. Ashley took her brother's passing very hard, and she was very close with him. Fast forward to today. Ashley has a son that we'll call Adam. She called me and asked me to watch him since he was homesick from school while she went to work. I agreed and came straight over. Everything was normal. Adam was at the dining room table. He was playing a game on his laptop, still in his pajamas. He's a great kid. He never complains or gives anybody trouble. I went to the restroom, which is down the hallway past the living room. This bathroom shares a wall with the master bedroom's bathroom wall. As I'm doing my business, I heard the water turn on and off twice from that bathroom, followed by talking. I can hear what sounds like two people talking very fast, but it was muffled. I didn't think much of this, figuring that Adam must have wandered in there with the two dogs. He's nine, and he talks to the dog sometimes as most kids do. I came out of the bathroom to find him still in the same position at the kitchen table, and the dogs were sleeping on the couch. I said, hey buddy, did you go into your mom's bathroom and have the water on? He looked puzzled and said, no, I haven't left this table, and I don't go in there. I then went to the kitchen sink and noticed it was dry, so the water I heard being turned on had to have come from the master bathroom. And what about the talking I heard? I chalked it up to maybe the next door neighbors. A few hours go by and Adam is on the couch with me, watching TV, and the dogs were there too. I start hearing things being moved in the master bedroom, almost like somebody was cleaning up, picking things up and setting them back down. The dogs then start to bark and run to the master bedroom door. This repeats every half an hour or so until David comes home. I explained my experience, and he just smiled and nodded. I asked him what he was smiling about, and he said, Ashley's brother's ashes are in the bedroom, and she recently got the ashes of her stepdad from her sister. She mixed the ashes. That's the talking you heard. Her brother and stepdad. They used to sit in the garage together and just chatter all through the night. At this point, I'm creeped out. David is glad that someone believes him now. I told Ashley about my experience, but she refuses to believe any of it. I personally think she's in denial, and I don't really blame her. It's scary stuff, and it's hard to believe unless you experience it for yourself. I've never seen anything paranormal before or after that, and I hope I never do, because hearing that stuff gave me enough chills to last a while. I was babysitting my nephew one night, who was still a little kid in diapers, but could talk. I'm not really sure how old he was, but he was little. My friend Matt had come over, and we were each playing PlayStations on separate TVs, back to back. My nephew starts crying upstairs, where he's sleeping in my mom's bed. I run up to check on him, and he says that there's a man behind the bedroom door. Now the bedroom door is open, and I can clearly see that there is no man hiding behind it. Then, just as I turn back, the door swings back with force over the carpet and bangs against the wall. I picked him up and decided to move him to my room. My room, at the time, was the room in the southeast corner of the house. I get him settled and he's just about to go back to sleep, when the closet door opens, folding in half slowly. I remember the dread that came over me. I took my nephew and yelled down to Matt to pack the systems up. My sister, who I was babysitting for, lived just across the road, so I moved us to her place. As we were about to cross, and I'm not kidding, a power line dropped from the pole and started jumping around at the end of my sister's driveway. I think that night was the second weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. Perhaps it was all just a weird coincidence, but still, 
freaks me out to this day. I had a very strange babysitting experience the other night. Everything was normal until the kids were in bed. One of the kids kept running around, but finally they were down. And so I was just scrolling through random videos on Instagram to pass the time. I was watching one and I heard something. It was like a man or one of the boys pretending to have a deep voice was upstairs. It just said, no, or something like that in this weird crowley voice. I was confused and a little spooked, but I brushed it off and sat on the couch to watch a movie. Their dog was walking around and growling at the windows that led to the backyard. That creeped me out too, but I tried to brush that off. I thought maybe the dog had seen a squirrel or something. At this point, it's about 10 p.m. The dog was laying on my lap and started growling and barking toward the kitchen. At this point, I was like, you better cut that out, because who on earth wouldn't be creeped out by that? Later, I heard these incredibly light, whispery voices, like children. I wasn't completely sure if it was just the kids waking up and making noises, but it only lasted a moment after I noticed. I didn't even have time to go up and check. I noticed all these weird things, but I didn't really put them all together until later that night. I talked to my mom, and she told me that my sister and her friend had babysat there as well, and they both had odd experiences. Bad vibes, the kid telling her she'd seen some things, and the kids actually addressing something that wasn't there. My mom didn't tell me before I went over so that I wouldn't be spooked, which I guess was good, because I got an independent witness of whatever happened without being influenced by the experiences of others. Anyway, I'll still go back to babysit. I'll just be prepared to throw hands with Casper if I have to, I guess. I babysit for my mom's friend a lot. He has three daughters, but I usually only babysit the youngest, who's five years old. Last weekend, I stayed at their house overnight. During dinner that night, we were talking while I was walking around and cleaning up. All of a sudden, she asks, why is his face like that? I asked who she was talking about because there was nobody else in the house. She says, the man in the chair. Obviously, I see nobody in the chair, so I say, I don't know, why don't you ask him yourself? And she responds, I don't want to, he scares me. I try to ask what he looks like, but she refuses to tell me. Then we finish eating and she never mentions him again. But she does keep trying to make excuses to not go to sleep, which is really weird for her because she loves bedtime. After I get her to sleep, I took pictures around the kitchen, just to see if anything would show up, but I got nothing. I've had paranormal experiences before, but never in their house that I know of. So maybe it's just a kid's creepy imagination, but she only watches things like Frozen and My Littlest Pony, so I don't think it's something she saw, at least not on television. It still creeps me out. So 30 years ago, I'm about 13 to 14. An older friend and I are babysitting for a six-year-old girl and her younger brother. We had been told that sometimes the girl complains about seeing a ghost man in her bedroom and upstairs at night, and that he comes out through the attic door. Now, I didn't believe a word of it, 
Kids are weird and they say weird things. We get the kids ready for bed, but they would not settle. The girl said that she felt scared and her little brother started crying. She asked if she could sleep in her mom's bed until she got home and the little brother wanted to go with her. So I tucked them in and I told them some silly stories and I laughed until they were both tired. Both kids were virtually asleep when we left. Door ajar, hall light on. An hour later, we're sitting downstairs watching the equalizer and all was good. The kids were definitely asleep as I had to sneak past their room to use the bathroom. I even had a quick peek on my way back. The little brother got a bit of a mini shoot snore going on, but everything else was quiet. Back downstairs, we watched TV a bit more. About 20 minutes go by, and out of nowhere, we hear banging. Heavy, heavy banging. The kids start screaming immediately. I run up the stairs and meet the kids as they're running out of the room. Now before, I thought it was the kids, but this time I have my eyes on the kids, so I know that they're not making the sound. And we hear it again. Bang, bang. The kids fly at me. I grab the little brother and we rush down the stairs into the front room, shut all the doors, and all crash onto the sofa. Everything is silent, apart from the TV, which I turn off. We sat in silence for about five minutes, just kind of holding each other. After a few minutes, the little girl, with tears in her eyes, just says in a very matter-of-fact way, The man was angry because I wasn't in my room, so he tried to push over the wardrobe and then started thumping the wall. This event has stayed with me all these years. In fall of 2019, I started babysitting for a new family. They live in a house that was built in the 1920s. I've always believed in angels and demons, not necessarily just ghosts. One of the first times I was babysitting the three-year-old and the one-year-old, I was putting them to bed, and I thought I heard somebody knocking on their front door downstairs. I looked out the window to see if the parents were home, but nobody was there. I decided to just ignore it. Another time, again, I was putting them to bed, and I heard what sounded like a man and a woman having a conversation in the kitchen. So, assuming the parents had gotten home, I walked down to greet them, but nobody was there. Yet another time, I was watching them during the day, when the mom was out of town and the dad was at work. I expected him home at about 3.30 p.m. The girls were napping upstairs, and I heard the kitchen door open and footsteps. I was surprised that the dad was back so early. As I turned the corner to go greet him in the kitchen, I saw what I thought was him, black suit and all, walk past the door frame. As I entered the kitchen, I started to say, didn't expect you back so early, but there was no one there. The last time I ever babysat them, I was playing in the backyard with the girls. Let me remind you that the oldest one is three. She's constantly scared to be alone in the dark, which I thought was strange because usually at such a young age, kids haven't really had any experiences to make them this afraid of a particular thing. That day, she said, I saw a slender man in my bathroom mirror and he waved back at me. I was terrified. I asked her to repeat what she had just said several times. Slenderman. She is three. There's no reason for her to already know what that means. At that moment, I realized that I always closed her bathroom door just because it felt creepy. And whenever I would come back into the room later, the door was always open. I have never babysat for them again.
About 13 years ago, my sister lived in a house in a not-so-great neighborhood. You'd come through the kitchen and then the dining room and turn left into the living room. Behind the living room was a hall to the main bathroom and all the bedrooms. The couch was positioned with its back to the hallway. At the end of the hall was a bedroom that always creeped us out. We didn't ever go in there or in the half bath that was inside of it. She mostly has boxes in there. Well, my niece's nursery was right beside that room, and we always had weird stuff happen in there. One time, my sister was asleep and heard a voice scream one of my niece's names in her ear. She got up and ran into the nursery and saw a dark figure over the crib. My niece had gotten tangled in the crib bumpers. The figure looked at her and disappeared. Now, that was the least creepy thing. Whenever I was over, I used to have nightmares about the main bathroom being covered in blood. I have a lot of nightmares though, so I never thought anything of it. Until one night, I was supposed to be babysitting while she went out on a date night. I was laying on her couch, and she was in the bathroom taking a shower. I'm just hanging out, and I hear her call my name. I called back, What? And she yelled back, Nothing. I just shook it off as her being annoyed, and it happened three more times. Finally, I got up and stormed to the bathroom door and knocked as loud as I could. I said, You're gonna wake up the girls. Why do you keep calling me? She was quiet for a second and said, I'm not calling you. I was pretty creeped out, but I went to sit back on the couch to wait for her to be done showering. Then I heard the door of the back bedroom creak. I turned around, looked down the hall, and saw the door open by itself. And then, in my sister's voice, I heard something say, Hey, come here. Nope. She moved out soon after. All kinds of crazy things happened there. We later found out that a man killed his mother in her bathroom and then killed himself, just a few years before my sister lived there. We couldn't remember the address when we found the news story, but it was on the same street and it looked like the house. It would also explain the nightmares I had, so I'm pretty sure that it was definitely that house. So this happened a few months ago. I was babysitting my baby brother late at night. I'd say around 11 o'clock. I have a video baby monitor with me almost all the time, apart from this one time where I left it in my room while I went to grab a drink downstairs. While downstairs, I heard a loud crash coming from my parents' room, where he sleeps as he's quite young. I also hear him crying. Obviously panicked, I rush up the stairs, and I find that my brother is sleeping soundly, but my parents' TV is on the floor, and the screen is cracked. I put it back up and just hoped that my mom would believe me that I had no idea how it had fallen. Considering that it's quite heavy and on a stable surface, and the cats can't even knock it over, I was quite confused. Go forward a couple of minutes, and I'm in my room just relieved that my brother is safe. But I feel this constant negative energy. Anxiety just filled me. And I could feel eyes on me. But I knew that no one was home. Soon after my parents return, I tell my mom what happened. She checked my brother and the TV. She calls me in and says, what crack? I walked in to find that the TV was completely fine. I still can't explain what happened. I have this memory from when I was like three or four. I was being babysat by an uncle, 
and it was just the two of us in the house. I was sitting on his lap, and he was reading me a story. We were in a large recliner. All of a sudden, something moved above him. I looked, and I noticed an arm that came up over the back of the recliner and rested lifelessly next to my uncle's shoulder. It was pasty and thin, and suddenly I started to realize that this was not his arm. The second that I realized that, I became inconsolable. I screamed and screamed until my parents picked me up. I was far too young to articulate what I had seen, and they probably assumed that I was just cranky and ready for bed. Nothing else ever came of it, but I still remember it to this day. My father had training in Phoenix this week, so we left Las Vegas on Sunday and passed through Jerome for dinner. We didn't stay, but we planned to pass through the town before, so we watched ghost adventures and did a tad bit of research on the hotel. The Jerome Grand Hotel in Arizona is apparently haunted, and we thought that was kind of cool. We got to Jerome around 6 p.m. and went to the hotel to eat dinner at the Asylum restaurant inside. When we first got there, I had to use the restroom. Entering the male's bathroom closet to the restaurant, I walked into an empty bathroom with the three urinals out of order and just one stall near the very end. I supposed that they left the bathrooms the same from when it was a hospital, since it looked like one of the blue and whitish old hospital rooms. Being in that bathroom gave me a very eerie feeling. Not hearing a sound made me constantly on alert for the unexplained footsteps or disembodied voices or breaths. I didn't notice anything except how much I was shaking, but when I finally exited the restroom, the unsettling feeling that I felt within carried throughout the rest of the building. We then just sat down for dinner about an hour or two and nothing weird happened during that. Then when we were finished with dinner at around 8 p.m., my dad wanted to get going because we needed to get to the hotel in Phoenix for his training that week, but I was desperate to at least check out the hotel part of the building and see room 23, supposedly the room with the most activity in the hotel. So before we left, we took a visit to the floor above the restaurant, and my father got a picture of me in front of the door to that room. After that, I decided to just pull out my phone and take some live pictures. I only took three the first two being down the hallway from room 23, which had no weird anomalies in them, and the final picture being just a quick one of the stairs closest to room 23 that led to the floor above. After that, we finally exited the building and went back to our ride to Phoenix. I didn't look at the photos directly after taking them, and only remembered to give them a look after I couldn't get any service a little while after exiting Jerome. That's when I saw the first two photos, and despite being a little disappointed that I didn't receive anything, finally came to the last photo I took real quick before I left, and I noticed what looked like an orb moving down the stairs. There have been stories of the spirit of a little girl roaming the property, and the orb moving in a hop-like pattern down the stairs seemed, in my opinion, to be a pretty childish gesture, as I commonly hopped down the stairs when I was younger. A few days after we visited Jerome, while we were sleeping at a hotel in Phoenix, I had just fallen asleep before I dramatically awoke after dreaming or visualizing the image of electricity slowly moving through a solenoid before reaching a core, which then caused me to wake up. It had the similar feeling of when you wake up from that feeling of falling, but this felt a little different. I'm not sure if it's related to my time at the Jerome Grand Hotel due to the fact that I haven't experienced anything else, but I thought I would share it anyway, just in case. Number 
Not too long ago, my brother was telling my mom about something that my dad had said to him quite a few years ago that always puzzled him. My dad passed away over 10 years ago, so I can't ask him about it, and it really bugs me that I can't get more information. My dad loved being in the woods. They were like a second home to him. Whenever we would take a family trip into the woods, I could ask him what any animal sound was that I heard from the area, and he could tell me exactly what animal was making it and any other details I asked. He grew up on a farm, spent time as a forest ranger working in the fire towers, and he enjoyed hunting, so he knew nature pretty well. The woods that we would take family trips to, he was also very familiar with, as some of the fire towers that he worked in were still standing in the area. I think nowadays only one does. My brother said that there was a weekend that my dad decided to take a trip to the woods by himself to do some small game hunting. Not unusual at all for him. The strange part was that my dad came home early. From where we lived at the time, it took two and a half hours and sometimes longer depending on traffic to get to the woods that he liked. He didn't spend the night, even though he had brought everything he needed to camp for two nights. Both my mom and my brother remember him coming home early. Only, my dad never mentioned why to my mom and only let it slip to my brother once. My dad told my brother that he heard something making a sound in the woods, a sound that he had never heard before in all his life. He knew it wasn't from any of the animals in those woods. The sound made him pack up and head home during the night my brother tried to press him for more details, but he quickly changed the subject and never wanted to discuss it again. He never described what type of sound it was. He just said that it wasn't from any of the animals that inhabited those woods. None of the natural ones, anyway. My dad was never easily spooked, especially by nature. Whatever he heard, we have no idea, but it sure got to him good. It eats at me that I can't ask him about it. I really want more details. My brothers still take trips to those woods, and they've never heard anything out of the ordinary while out there. So, maybe we'll never know. This happened when I was 12 and had just started babysitting our neighbor's three-year-old girl. I am a twin, so at that age my sister and I did everything together, even babysitting. The house next door was built in the 1800s and brought a lot of history. My grandparents actually owned it at one time before inheriting the house next door, the house we lived in. I grew up in an all-female household. My grandfather passed away when we were young, so at the current house it was my grandma, my single mother, my twin sister and I, and our younger sister. I attribute some of the experiences to poltergeist due to the family makeup. I've read several hypotheses where poltergeist activity happens a lot around young females. Anyway, back to the story. My twin and I are at the house built in the 1800s. It's our first night ever babysitting, and it's the parents' first night away from their three-year-old daughter. The daughter screams and screams at the top of her lungs due to the separation from her parents. This goes on and on. My sister and I tried playing with her, talking to her, singing to her, but nothing worked. This was in the mid-90s, so we, as 12-year-olds, did not have cell phones. We used our neighbor's house phone to call my grandma and mom to see what we might do to calm her down. It ends up that they have the answer. Put in a VHS of Barney. It worked like a charm. The kid calms down and goes to bed as scheduled at 8pm with no further issues. My twin and I are sitting on the couch watching TV when at about 9.30 the entire house starts shaking and there's this loud pounding noise. 
It seems to be coming from the entire house and not one area. We had no idea what to do. We were pretty responsible at that age, so we ran upstairs to check on the baby. She's sound asleep, not even phased with what's going on. We pick up the cordless phone to call my mom and grandma, but the phone is just static. No dial tone and no other phone in the house. This is New York, so there are no earthquakes and no quarries in the area. My sister and I have seen too many horror films and we aren't separating. So we huddle at the top of the stairs where we can keep an eye on the baby, but also be in the hallway light. After 10 full minutes, the pounding and shaking finally stops. We try the phone again, and it works this time. My mom and grandma didn't hear or feel anything. Both my sister and I were sure, with how loud it was and how violently the house was shaking, that it had to be felt next door and that it had to be something going on in the area but no one else felt or heard anything. It was such a bizarre experience. We stayed the remainder of the evening with no issues, and we didn't mention it to the parents as we didn't want to come across as crazy as our mom and grandma had already made us feel that we were. We never again experienced anything like that when babysitting. We even returned to that house again, but had no further issues. Last year, my husband and I were babysitting our niece and nephew. Their family lives about an hour and a half from where we live. On this particular visit, their parents were out late, so we didn't actually begin to head home until about one or two in the morning. The area that we live in is in the southeast of the United States, and it is very heavily wooded in most areas. The roads are pretty secluded, and houses are usually far apart from one another and can be miles back off of the actual roads themselves. When we left, my husband was driving and I was in the passenger seat. We'd been traveling down an empty road for probably 45 minutes. There were no houses off to the side, just guardrails and woods. It was slightly foggy as well, but not bad enough to impair vision. I'm not sure how to transition into the next part other than saying that suddenly, something really weird happened. I was staring straight ahead, also assuming that my husband was as well since he was driving, and a man just appeared partially in the road on my side. He wasn't fully in the road, but enough to alarm an unsuspecting driver in the middle of the night. He was a young man, blonde, and he was wearing a white tank top and brownish-orange pants. He had nothing with him. He was just standing there. I recall the weirdest part of this entire encounter was the way that he was standing and how he was looking at me. He had his back partially turned toward the car as if he was walking, but stopped in his tracks. His head was turned facing the car and his eyes were locked, and I mean locked, on mine. I know that sounds like bull, especially being as we were going 55 miles per hour with bright headlights on and it was the middle of the night. It's probably impossible that he even saw me, let alone locked eyes with me. But that's exactly why this freaked me out so much. We passed him as quickly as we came upon him and then he was gone. I looked at my husband and laughed and said, that was freaking weird. He just looks at me and says, what are you talking about? After asking him several more times, it was determined that he didn't see this person. From my point of view, it was impossible that he didn't see him. This person was almost in the road and was a striking contrast to the surrounding scenery due to the bright clothes he was wearing and how the headlights really displayed that. I didn't even consider this to be linked to a paranormal occurrence until after I realized that I was the only witness and also after I gave more thought into how the whole scenario made me feel really... off. Just how this person really seemed to be looking right at me. I just don't know what to think. If I was going to have a paranormal experience, I guess I should be thankful that it was just this, 
because I suppose it could have been much worse. This is a story that happened to me years ago that I never really talk about much. I thought it might be interesting to tell this story. When I was a teenager, I made money by babysitting. On this particular night, I was working at a house a few minutes from my home, so I had been able to work later than usual. The family had two little girls that I was watching, around four to seven years old. First, to give a bit of background on what the home looked like, which will be important later, the house had two floors and two staircases that led to the upstairs. One set was off the kitchen, and the other was in the foyer. This home had an alarm system that would beep three times when any door was opened, although it would not say which door it was. I was sitting in the kitchen at around 11 p.m. and coloring to pass the time at the kids' table. The parents had said they would be home between 11.30 and midnight, and I was starting to get antsy to go home. I heard the alarm for the door and got up, expecting to see the parents coming in. When they didn't, I went back to what I was doing. About 15 minutes later, it went off again. This time I felt a little creeped out, so I went around checking all the doors, which I all found to be shut tight and locked. I sat back down, figuring that there must be some kind of glitch in the system. Within about a minute, the door alarm went off twice, as if two doors had been opened in quick succession, and as I stood up, I heard a little girl screaming bloody murder. I raced up the stairs into the girl's shared room, and I found them both sleeping soundly. I checked all the nooks and crannies of their room, and I remember feeling that the only thing that seemed different was that the book that I had read to them was on the floor instead of on the bookshelf. I ended up checking the stairs and the other rooms as I felt pretty unsure of the girl's safety, but I found nothing and all the doors were still locked. I ended up sitting back down in the kitchen feeling stupid and not long after, the alarm beeped once, really loudly, which I had never heard before, and the panel didn't seem to give an explanation for what this meant. After that, everything stopped, and the parents came home not long after. I managed to convince myself at the time that I was just imagining things, but after all this time, I can still remember the fearful scream very clearly. Nothing too exciting, but something that I've never been able to forget. This happened on a family trip to Texas. We rented an RV to travel across the state with. We live in Florida. We left on a Tuesday. We were off to Texas to visit my cousin and her kids, so the family decided since we're here, why not go to Arizona to see the Grand Canyon, Mystery Mountain, OK Corral, and the Painted Desert. The interesting part of the story happened when heading into Mystery Mountain. We had to travel around this dark, deserted track around the mountain with no guardrail. And if you opened your door, you were looking down a cliff. So we traveled, and my father had rented an SUV to make his trip. He calls it white-knuckling when you drive some dangerous roads. We didn't see any other lights than the ones from our headlights, and finally we get all the way to the bottom. All of the men get out of the car to use the bathroom. Like I said, no lights on the way up or behind us. No one leading up to the track we had taken. Then we see something strange. A motorcycle passes us, with a female and a male on it. It was not going that fast. The thing that was odd, other than the fact that we didn't see their lights, is that the bike went about 30 feet and then disappeared. We saw all of it and then, poof, nothing. To this day, none of us can explain what happened.
So, a little backstory. My partner and I have been dating for about a year and a half. This February, I was given tickets as a birthday gift to finally go and visit him. I live in Scotland. So, I spent the middle of February over in Arizona visiting my partner. While we both are interested in the paranormal, I believe in it all, having had multiple experiences. Whereas he tends to just humor me, not believing much of it himself. He's never mentioned anything odd happening in his apartment, but I saw, heard, and felt small things the first couple of days I was there. One morning in particular, at around 4am, I was on the sofa, playing on my phone, dealing with jet lag, when I looked up and saw a figure standing over him as he slept. It was similar to the shadow person phenomenon, just a dark humanoid shape, but it felt nasty. When I saw it, it turned, almost as if it was startled to see somebody else in the room, never mind someone who could also see it. It did a sort of double take, and then disappeared, but the room felt off. I performed a cleansing ritual that I've come to rely on when negative energies are bothering me. For the remainder of my trip, the apartment felt light and airy, with the exception of later that day, when I was taking a nap. I felt what I thought was my partner standing over me and watching me sleep. I opened my eyes and I felt the negative presence over me, as though trying to work out who I was and why I was there. I told it in very clear terms that it wasn't welcome, whether I was there or not, and it cleared out. No more issues, so that was fine. My partner's friends, another couple, really helped in making me feel welcome and the four of us went out on road trips a couple of times, once to Jerome, and another to a recreation spot by a lake. I felt a little funny any time we were driving around or near or on the reservations, as though the native spirits were very much aware of us traveling through their land, but nothing felt bad, just sort of a curiosity. But one instance in particular sticks out. While driving toward Phoenix after a day at the lake, we were all chatting away in the car when we got into reservation territory. I got that not alone feeling again, but still, it was curious, though this time it was more intense. There was a lull in the conversation, and I was just admiring the landscape as the sun was going down, when in the middle of the center embankment on the road, there was a figure that suddenly appeared out of nowhere. I know it was male, and I know he was Native American. Nothing felt wrong, but when I asked if anybody else had seen him, they all said no, despite the fact that, as far as I was concerned, you couldn't miss him. He was old, tall, completely white, clothes, hair, and everything, with an aura of hazy light around him, simply standing watching over the road. I don't know who he was, but it felt like he was watching over the people traveling through his land. It was comforting. I don't really know why I'm telling anybody this, other than I felt that I needed a lighter story to go with the spookier one at the beginning. I hope you enjoyed, and if you've ever had similar experiences, I'd be happy to know about them. My partner and I are good friends with another couple that we often go over to hang out with. We'll call them Ashley and David. We go to their house about twice a week and nothing out of the ordinary ever happens. We usually just hang out and talk for hours with a few beers. David has mentioned a few times that he has seen Ashley's deceased brother around the house. Ashley always rolls her eyes and says that she doesn't believe in things like that. Ashley took her brother's passing very hard, and she was very close with him. Fast forward to today. Ashley has a son, and we'll call him Adam. She called me and asked me to watch him since he was home sick from school while she goes to work. I agreed and came straight over. Everything was normal. Adam was at the dining room table. He was playing a game on the laptop, still in his pajamas, 
He's a great kid, never complains or gives anybody trouble. I went to the restroom, which is down the hallway past the living room. This bathroom shares a wall with the master bedroom bathroom wall. As I'm doing my business, I heard the water turn on and off twice from that bathroom, followed by talking. I can hear what sounds like two people talking very fast, but it was muffled. I didn't think much of this. I figured Adam must have wandered in there with the two dogs. He's nine and talks to the dogs like most kids do. I came out of the bathroom to find him still in the same position at the kitchen table and the dog sleeping on the couch. I asked him, hey buddy, did you go into your mom's bathroom and have the water on? He looked puzzled and said, no, I haven't left this table and I don't go in there. I then went to the kitchen sink and noticed it was dry. So the water I heard being turned on had to have come from the master bathroom. What about the talking I heard? I chalked it up to maybe the next door neighbors. A few hours go by and Adam is on the couch with me, watching TV as well as the dogs. I start hearing things being moved in the master bedroom, almost like someone is cleaning up, picking things up and setting them back down. The dogs then start to bark and run to the master bedroom door. This repeated itself every half hour or so until David came home. I explained my experience and he just smiled and nodded. I asked him what he was smiling about and he said, Ashley's brother's ashes are in the bedroom and she recently got the ashes of her stepdad from her sister. She mixed the ashes. That's probably the talking that you heard her brother, and her stepdad. They used to sit in the garage together and just chatter away through the night. At this point, I am creeped out. David is glad that someone believes him now. I told Ashley about my experience, but she refuses to believe any of it. I personally think she's in denial, which I don't blame her for. It's scary stuff, and it's hard to believe unless you experience it for yourself. I've never seen anything paranormal, and I hope I never do, because just hearing things gives me enough chills to last a while. I like to look out for new, out-of-the-way fishing holes. If I'm on a trip and have my gear, I'll pull up a map, look at the different connecting waterways, and try to find back roads that may lead to spots that few people know about. On one trip, about 10 years ago, I'm in Western Pennsylvania, and I'm looking for a road to connect me with this small and out of the way stream that I had found on the map. I'm in the country. It's not too desolate, but houses are definitely getting farther and farther apart and looking more and more beat up. I surmise that I'm really close to where this stream is supposed to be. So I turn down a dirt road that leads toward a tree line in the direction that I believe the stream is located. The road starts out in okay shape, but as soon as I pass into the tree line, stuff gets weird. It's mid afternoon but the canopy of the trees is so thick that it suddenly looks like dusk. Then the road very quickly deteriorates, starts to close in, and then starts to vanish. There are banks on either side of me, so I figure I'm on some sort of old logging road that rarely, if ever, gets vehicles on it anymore. The road is getting worse and worse. Large rocks start appearing at random places in the road, first sporadically, and then more frequently. It's very unnatural looking. It almost looks like they were placed there on purpose. My car is four wheel drive, but I'm getting a little worried because the rocks are getting larger. Combined with this is how tight the road is now. Driving around them starts to get a little sketchy. I'm now driving very slowly so I don't pop a tire or make a wrong move and get stuck on the bank or something. 
the road suddenly takes a very sharp left hand and downward turn. I creep along this turn, but I stop as I see the road continuing down on this weird trajectory. At this moment, my gut starts talking to me and telling me to turn around. But it's also at this point that I realize I can't. The road is not wide enough to do a three-point turn. I could chance it, but if I didn't want to get my front end caught on something that might be pushing over the bank or my back end going off the back in the other direction and getting stuck, I just couldn't do it. I say to myself, keep pushing forward and you're bound to just get enough room to turn around shortly. As I make my way driving this weird downward road with sharp curves and oddly placed rocks, I start to see items off to the sides of the road. At first, it's just garbage. Bottles, boxes, wrappers. Then I start seeing toys. Kids toys. Lots of them. Like an uncomfortable amount. Then I start seeing clothes. Some look old and weathered like they've been there for years, and some look fairly new. The amount of clothing I'm seeing also increases. Then I start seeing mattresses. Not like one random mattress. Lots of them. All over the place, and there are dirty and dark stains on them. My gut is now screaming at me to get out of there, but I still don't have room to turn around. While I'm sitting there and trying to figure out what my next move is, I get the distinct feeling that I'm being watched. The moment that feeling hits me, I audibly yell at myself, nope. Then I slam the car in reverse and drive reverse dodging all of the random rocks all of the way back up and out. I do this until the path levels out again. I was in full F this mode, and I just risk making the three-point turn. My back end goes slightly off the bank, and I slam back into drive and pound the gas to throw myself back onto the road and out of whatever dark woods bullshit I had discovered. I have no clue what I happened across that day. Best case scenario was probably some deep woods meth den. Worst case? I don't even want to think about it. All I know is ever since then, no matter what I'm doing, the moment my gut starts to tell me to get out, I get out. So, a little background to set the mood, and this is all 100% true. I grew up in central New York, between Parrish and Mexico. You can look up Happy Valley and see just how creepy it is. Surrounded by woods, farms, fields, gravel pits, and swamps. I'm outside roughly 90% of my day. I do firewood, logging, farming, hunting, fishing, and trapping. I'm certainly used to the creepy shit in the woods, so much so that there's a predator light on my walking stick, which is a backwards-facing LED light. People deter tigers from leapfrogging on them by wearing masks on the back of their heads, but we only have fishers, coyotes, and the occasional wandering bear. So every night, on the wood line, I have a pimp fire pit set up that I use pretty much every single night. It's not uncommon to see raccoons and foxes. We feed the birds and even have a huge turkey and deer feeder. My house is basically a safe haven. We constantly have critters running amok in the daytime and especially at night in the shadows. So you get used to the random ground leaf flutter, twig snapping, chittering critters in the forest nooks and crannies staring at you, wondering if you're going to eat that last hot dog. It can be unnerving, honestly. But then, there's my clicky buddy who always says goodnight to me. It began when I moved into a good buddy's house. He and I are very much alike. Hard-working outdoorsmen who hunt, 
trout, and collect firewood. I've recently gone through some changes in my life and I was lucky enough to move in with him, which is only four miles away from where I grew up. Every night after working or running through a trap line, I'd work on my fire pit, which is in a clearing we made to store firewood right on the edge of the forest. I'd hear this clicking, like a slower version of the predator's clicks. The sound was kind of random at first, but then I noticed it reacting to me moving, grabbing a beer, click, click, packing a pipe, click, building up the fire or taking a leak, click, click. At first it freaked me out, like to the point of carrying a bigger knife than I should. Some nights a loaded 223. A couple of those wandering bears came within a quarter mile of my fire pit, so. I wear a headlamp, I have a lit lantern by me, a roaring fire, a machete, the walking stick, so I'm pretty comfy, even though I'm kind of crapping my pants as I yell at the darkness to come and get me. So when the fire dies down, no more smoke for the pipe or hot dogs for my belly, I'll start packing up my stuff and get ready to head inside. Click, click. I look around for eye shine. Nothing. I move closer to the woods, stray a little to reposition my headlamp casting shadows. Click. I've even clicked back, and it kind of responded to me a few times, but I could just be stoned out of my gourd. I mean, it's freaked me out so much a few times, I've literally built up the fire just to walk away. My fire pit is built for that kind of thing. I'm literally a pro at having fires. When I did, click, click. Now, we do have nocturnal flying squirrels here, and one trick the squirrels, all squirrels, do is that they'll hide on the opposite sides of trees as you pass by. You'll never see or hear them. You won't know that they're there. Unless a friend is walking 20 feet in the same direction and you're both looking up at the trees, the squirrels can't hide from both of you. But I don't think this is what I'm hearing. It would make sense, since I can't see whatever's making the noise, but they tend to chitter more than click click. So now it's been over a year or so of hearing this sound and I'm nowhere closer to finding out what it is. I've come to accept it. I'll even leave some food at the edge of the wood line, beginning of a trail for it, which is usually where I relieve myself and then go back to the fire or inside. So almost every night, I'll hear the clicks. And I'll say goodnight back. Or call its mom a dirty name. I mean, I don't speak click. Who knows what I'm saying? But I click back anyway. And then I head inside. I suppose this isn't a scary story. It's just creepy, and I wanted to share it. Growing up, I had a childhood friend that lived relatively close by. We were like two peas in a pod. We were both adventurous, believed in the paranormal, enjoyed astronomy, and generally just being outside. She was born in Alaska, and her dad lived there for quite a while. So they were always into camping, hiking, fishing, skiing, you name it. It was with my friend's family that I got introduced to fishing and did a lot of camping. This happened during the mid to late 90s, and we were maybe around 10 to 12 years old. It's been a while, so I can't remember exactly. One camping trip, we went to this lake in the forest that was surrounded by a meadow. And feeding the lake was a small stream leading out of the woods. Anyway, we played in the meadow and stream all day while my friend's dad fished. The lake wasn't very big, and because it had a meadow all around it, he could keep an eye on our whereabouts while he fished. While messing around by the stream, the wooded area it was coming from gave me weird vibes. Can't explain it, I just felt really uneasy. Anyway, the day faded away into early evening, and it was time to leave and find a camping spot. 
My friend's dad picked up his fishing gear and we all walked back to the truck on this long winding path through the woods. Once in the truck, we drove into a more remote area of the forest and made our way up this steep road that was so rough and at such an incline that I was convinced my friend's dad was going to break his truck. He had a four, maybe six cylinder Toyota pickup that was about as basic as a truck could get. In fact, I'm not even sure if the truck had four wheel drive, but being an Alaskan outdoorsman with years of experience, I trusted him. We finally made it up to the top, which was flat and relatively open, with a big area of forest in the opposite direction from the road we drove up. We pitched our tents, got everything set up, and my friend and I decided to go explore the area. We were maybe 50 yards from the tent when we heard a big crack as a tree branch snapped in the woods behind us. We got quiet and looked in that direction, but didn't see anything. Thinking it was just a deer, we brushed it off. As we were walking, we heard it again and whispered to one another about what it could be, but kept going. It stopped briefly, and when we were about 200 yards from our camp, we sat on a boulder looking down the steep wooded hill overlooking the dirt road from where we'd come. Suddenly, we heard another cracking branch from behind. Whatever it was seemed to be following us. Our imaginations going wild, we came up with everything from a serial killer stalking us in the woods to deer to Bigfoot. When we got back to the campsite, we told her dad what we had heard and how it seemed to be paralleling us. He kind of played it off as a black bear and secured all the food. Later on, my friend confided in me that her dad had gotten out his pistol and would be sleeping with it that night. My friend and I were sharing one tent and he was in his own tent not far from us, so we figured everything would be okay. I awoke some time in the middle of the night to hear something or someone walking outside. As I lay still, listening, I could hear it quietly circling the tent. It sounded like it was walking on two legs because it had a distinct rhythm in how it walked. Whatever it was sounded big as I could hear its weight, if that makes sense, as it put each foot down and walked. I could even hear relatively quiet, but deep, heavy breathing at times. As I lay there, listening, I could hear it wandering to the other parts of the campsite and then back to our tent, almost as if it was walking in a big, repetitive loop. This went on for who knows how long. It felt like an eternity. Terrified and unable to wake my friend, I lay there and listened until eventually I fell asleep. The next morning, I told my friend and her dad about it, but I don't know if they believed me or not. Interestingly, absolutely nothing in the camp was disturbed in any way. The ground was not very soft and in some places was covered in grass, so there were no footprints either. This is something that I have never been able to explain, and to this day, it lingers in the back of my mind whenever I camp. I always wonder what it was that walked around our tent all night. I live in a part of Alaska where there's nothing but woods all around. I'm the only person who lives in these woods for about 20 miles in all directions, so visitors are always a special event. This time, however, it was a creepy event. I decided to go camping in the woods about five miles away from my cabin because I was stressed out that week and needed to get away from it all. I found a nice clearing and set up camp before nightfall. These woods aren't very quiet. There are always birds chirping, the rustling of leaves, and bunnies and deer running about. It was about seven o'clock p.m. when the first incident happened. 
I was listening to the wilderness outside of my tent while the fire was dying down outside. I had my pack strung up in a tree and had my 12 gauge shotgun unloaded to my right. All of a sudden, all the noises in the area stopped. But then I heard what sounded like snow crunching. I thought it was just a deer. The only real predators in the area that I had known about were bears, but this was far too heavy to be a deer or a bear. It was circling my camp. All I could hear was the snow crunching underfoot. It sounded like it was a two-legged animal, slowly getting closer. It did this for hours. I had my 12 gauge ready, but only remembered it wasn't loaded when the animal was about seven feet away from my tent. I grabbed my box of buckshot and put the first shell in. Click. The footsteps stopped. Click, click, click. I kept straining to hear anything, but it never came. I fell asleep for a few hours, but woke up at about 2 a.m. My tent was open. My shotgun was right outside of my tent. I felt like I was being watched. All I could see were the stars in the pitch black nothingness, but two stars moved. I didn't know how to react. The two stars that moved were now coming closer. They were eyes. The animal had to have been nine feet tall. It kept coming closer. I could smell it now. It smelled like rotten meat and death. My shotgun was only a foot away from my hand. I carefully grabbed it. I prayed that it was still loaded and that this thing hadn't unloaded it. I pumped a shell into the chamber and took the shot. The light was almost blinding against the dark wilderness, but what I saw was worse. It was hairy, too hairy to be a human, too long to be a bear. Its feet were gigantic and they were a darkish color. The face had no hair, but was the same color as the feet. The eyes were huge and were looking right at me. The mouth was wide open and the teeth were long and yellow. The arms were long and hairy, just like the legs. Its height was about nine feet tall, like I said, maybe a few inches less. After the shot, I heard a scream that shook the tent and the ground around it. I hit the animal. I heard it run off into the wilderness, screaming all the way. I started packing right up in the pitch black night, looking up at the stars. Nothing moved this time though. As I was leaving the clearing in which I made my camp, I looked back and saw those same huge eyes shining in the darkness and they moved toward me. I ran through the woods, unsure of where I was going or what time it was. I could hear the leaves snapping behind me. And when I looked back, the eyes were there, but they were closer this time. I saw the lights of my house in the distance through the thick woods. I could still hear the snapping, but it was farther back this time. I made it home and locked my door. The paranoia almost made me pass out. I still felt like I was being watched, even though I closed all the curtains. The only window without curtains or blinds was a very small window that was above the kitchen sink. I was in the living room for about an hour. It was now 5.30 in the morning and the sun would be rising. I looked around the house, still paranoid. I saw the window above the sink in the kitchen, but there was nothing there. I felt relieved for a second until the eyes moved into place there looking right at me. We made eye contact and I saw the first rays of sunlight come through the window. The animal grunted and stomped back into the forest, shaking the ground and cabin as it moved. I don't see it often anymore, but it does show up. Sometimes when I'm in the living room watching a movie or making food in the kitchen, I see the eyes. It only comes at night 
but it's there. I feel that we've come to an agreement. I stay away from the woods at night, and I don't get eaten. I'll update you if anything else happens, but it's been months since the first incident, and nothing drastic has happened yet. It hasn't shown up in the last few days, actually, but I'm sure it'll be back soon. I go hunting in southern Illinois on property that my family owns. The place is my second home, and I have spent countless hours exploring all around every inch of it. Caught all the fish in the area, hunted every legal game, and spotted the rest. So when I say that I've never had an experience like this, just remember that this was my domain that I felt comfortable in, in any weather, at any time, with any equipment or lack thereof. Two deer seasons ago, I had pulled into the farm at probably 4.40 in the morning. It was November, so there were at least two hours left until sunlight. I pulled my stuff out of the truck and walked into the woods. I have my shotgun and a revolver and knife on my belt, an elbow light clipped to the front of me, a thermos of coffee, and a backpack with a book and a couple of other things for cleaning my deer should I get lucky. So I walk off the drive and into the woods. The tree stand I'm going to is less than a mile away, but through some dense second growth forest and down a rather steep hill, across some bottoms, then a lung burning steep climb to get to another ridge. I always dread the hike, but it's a good spot, so I do it often. I make it down to the bottoms, slush through the icy muck and get to climbing. With my flashlight clipped to my chest, I keep needing to physically turn my body to throw the beam around and see trees that I recognize to determine my path. This, of course, always gives the forest a horror movie vibe, even on the best of days. The leaves and underbrush are encased in frost, so every one of my steps comes with a solid crunch, no matter how quiet I'm trying to be. This time, though, I noticed there was more noise than usual. Something else was crunching close by, too. I walked about a quarter of the way up the hill, listening to my company the whole time, seeming to stay the same distance away as I moved. Naturally, I think to myself that I'm going to have a quick hunting day, so I plop my butt down next to a tree. I can't shoot until first light, but I'm hoping that if I stay really still, that whatever I'm hearing will just lounge around until then. So I click off my light, unsling the shotgun, and lay it over my knees to wait. Except I don't hear anything now. Whatever it was must have been spooked by my flashlight spinning all around as I sat. I still stayed a bit sipping some coffee to make sure, but after about 15 minutes or so of dead silence, I gave up. I probably didn't make it even four steps before the second moving thing starts up again. At this point, I'm still not freaked out. I stay facing the way I am and flip the light off again and sidestep behind a tree. Sure enough, I don't hear anything. Two minutes of sitting there frustrated before I start moving again, and my new friend does too. This is when I started to get freaked out because I worked my way up the hill, stopping to turn and look every so often. When I stopped, the sound would go on for just an infinitesimally longer amount of time than my own steps. Like something seeing me stop and doing its very best to stop before I heard it. This happened no less than four times, and by now I'm sweating bullets and freezing cold because I'm sweating bullets in the middle of winter. I abandoned my thermos near a tree so I could hold my flashlight and my revolver at the same time. The last hundred feet or so to my stand was done backwards so that I could be facing the noise and, in theory, keep it from moving. And I didn't hear anything again after that. I got up into my stand and smoked like five cigarettes in a row, 
It gave me a sense of security being up in a tree behind camouflage. Still, I only hunted for like an hour of daylight and went back early. And I wasn't moving slow heading back to the truck, even with the sun shining bright. I haven't told my family about this because they wouldn't believe me, but damn, it was freaky. The sound and when it decided to happen felt very human, which it likely was as poachers and trespassers occasionally wander onto our property. Still, ever since then when I go hunting, I'm much better about letting people know where I'm going and for how long. This incident happened in 1963 in BC. I was 22 and on my honeymoon when I saw a creature, what I would later call a Bigfoot. I saw it in the clear light of day, free of any obstruction, and I have thought about it every day since. My husband and I were camping in the Broken Islands. It was early June and the weather was beautiful. It was about seven in the evening and I walked to the edge of the water and began to wade out. The water came up to just below my shorts. I stood there and admired the beauty. The sun had not started to set yet, and there was a peaceful stillness at that moment. My husband was asleep in the tent, and I thought to wake him so we could cook dinner together. I turned back toward the beach, and it was standing there, motionless, I didn't hear it make a sound. The beachhead was gravel, and rocks that crunched and clicked as we moved around were everywhere, but I didn't hear this thing at all. I couldn't understand what I was looking at and just stood, frozen. My eyes were going all over its body, trying to comprehend. I thought it was a naked man at first. It was taller than me by a wide margin. I was five foot eight and this probably was over a foot taller. It was lean and lanky, like a basketball player. It hunched at the shoulders, had long arms that hung at its sides in a non-threatening manner. It had long fingers with black nails. It stood with its legs close together and had long feet, just like its hands and fingers. It had a round head and the face looked like a person but different. Something was off. The body was covered in a brownish hair, but its body outline was still visible. The hair stuck up like an orangutan. The skin on the hands, feet, and face was visible and grayish, dusty and ashy looking. Its eyes were black and I couldn't see any other color. We just stood there looking at each other. I was stunned and it was indifferent. He never looked away, but he had an expression of indifference. I said, hello, in a broken half whisper. I couldn't think of what else to do. He smiled at me. His lips peeled back, revealing large teeth like a horse's. They looked too big and square for the mouth. When I looked at it in the face, the eyes at that moment, I realized that this was not a person. It was like a person, but it was something different. A wave of nausea overtook me. I began to vomit and felt faint. The world started to spin. I moved toward the shore and fell on my hands and knees. I heaved with such force into the dirt. The spinning stopped and I sat up. He was gone. I was there on my knees and just kept replaying the incident in my head for I don't know how long. I stripped off my clothes and cleaned myself in the water. The sun was beginning to set and I got dressed and lay next to my husband. I don't remember sleeping, just fever, chills and dizziness. We left the next day. I never told my husband what I saw. We split up five years later. I live in Texas. I've remarried, 
had children, grandchildren, gotten divorced again, and remarried again. I never told a soul about what I saw. I would go to the library and look for books about monsters, trying to understand what it was, that thing I saw. Bigfoot became popular in the late 60s and 70s. I saw the infamous PGF footage. That's not like what I saw. What I stood staring at, what changed me forever, was something else. I came from a typical Texas, all-American family. I wasn't supposed to see this. Now I'm someone with a secret, something I could never talk about in my real life. My interest in this subject has been a complete secret. No one who knows me would ever guess. I have never said this out loud, but in 1963, I saw a Bigfoot. Where I live, we have had relatively few bid cases. There were almost none at all back in the fall. Because of that, although we were still living under certain restrictions, we had more public health sanctioned freedoms than many other places. For example, at the time, we were permitted to share our social bubble with one other household and travel within our region. My family and our fellow bubble family decided to take advantage of this by going on a fall getaway. We rented two side-by-side -side cabins in a beautiful waterfront wooded area and had a lovely relaxing weekend. Although there were other cabins nearby, most were not occupied and we saw no other people, although we did hear a dog barking a few times somewhere not far off. On our final night there, my son decided to sleep in the other cabin with his bubble siblings. Around 11 p.m., he called over, asking for some forgotten thing. It was a very dark night, and there were certainly no streetlights in the deeply wooded cabin area. So I grabbed my flashlight and walked the short distance to the neighboring cabin to deliver whatever it was that he needed. On the walk back, I heard a whistle. It was a very human sounding whistle, exactly the kind of whistle one makes to call in a dog. It sounded very close, but shining my light around, I saw nobody. I heard it again and assumed someone was whistling for the dog we'd heard earlier, so I didn't think much of it. A short time later, another call came from next door. My son couldn't settle and wanted to come back to our cabin. This time, my husband and I both walked over, collected our child and his stuff, said goodnight to our bubble family and walked back. We heard the same whistle again, several times. It seemed to be on the dirt road ahead of us, moving gradually away. My husband commented that the dog must have gotten loose and the owner was out looking for it. Inside our cabin, we continued to hear the whistling coming at irregular intervals of maybe two to four minutes. At first, it would be loud and seemed quite nearby. Then it would gradually grow fainter, then stop as though the whistler had moved out of earshot. Then it would seem to circle around, coming from the other direction, getting louder as it moved past our cabin, then fading again into the distance then it would start all over again. Still not thinking much of it, my husband climbed into the loft to go to sleep while I started to pack for the trip home the next day. Our son was sleeping in a little room on the main floor to the left of the front door and the small window in his room was cracked open to let in the unseasonably warm night air. I was standing by that window, quietly gathering his scattered things while the whistle once again drew closer. But this time, instead of fading as it passed by, the next one was very close and incredibly loud, 
as though the whistler was just outside my son's window. The blind was down, but I was sure someone was on the porch right outside. I leapt to the front door, flung it open and threw on the porch light, ready to tell off some prankster on our doorstep. Nobody was there. I grabbed my flashlight and took a few steps out past the circle of light, then thought better of it and retreated inside. I locked up the cabin, closed and latched all the windows and lowered all the blinds. If someone was creeping around outside our cabin, I didn't want them looking in at us from the darkness. Deciding that I did not want to leave my sleeping son downstairs by himself, I settled on the sofa with a book. The whistles continued. Between each one, I would convince myself it was just a bird or an animal, only to hear it again and be certain that it could only be a human sound. The irregularity of it and the slight variations in pitch and tone also told me that it wasn't something mechanical or electrical or automated. Around 1.30 in the morning, my husband suddenly got up and started to get dressed. I asked him what he was doing. I'm going to find out whoever that is and ask them why they've been whistling for hours, he said. I was horrified. My husband is a pretty big guy and I was as curious as he was, but I also felt deep in my bones that it would not be safe for him to go outside that night. I insisted that he go back to bed and thankfully he did. I sat vigil listening to the intermittent whistles for at least another hour until finally I dozed off on the sofa. When I awoke, it was morning. The sun was peeking around the blinds and the whistling had stopped. I cautiously peered outside, half expecting to see some sort of evidence of a nightmare intruder, but there was none. A little while later, we wandered next door, coffee mugs in hand, to get our friend's take on the mystery whistler. Amazingly, they had not heard a thing, despite the fact that the sound was so clearly audible in our cabin and would have had to have passed right by them. We couldn't understand how they hadn't heard it. At checkout, I asked the woman at the kiosk down the road about it, but she just looked at me strangely and said she didn't know what it could have been. When I got home, I searched for audios of bird calls common to the area, and then ones not common to the area, in the hope of finding that same whistle. Nothing I found was even close, and we still don't know what we heard that night, circling for hours and stopping just outside our cabin door. A couple of years ago, I babysat for a family friend. She and her husband lived with their two kids, a girl about seven who we'll call Kay, and a boy about 12 who we can call Jay. I babysat these kids so much that we became very close, brother and sister type deal. They weren't difficult kids. They had a hard home life because their parents were borderline abusive, but they were still good kids. I tried my best to be a positive adult I was only 18 or 19 during this experience. The family moved around a lot. I've known them now for over six years and they have moved every single year. This experience happened in 2015. I was halfway through my senior year when the family moved into this house. It was really nice. It had just been built in 2013 or something like that. It was a nice neighborhood, but rent was really low. The mother often bragged about the steal of a deal she got for the house. To put it in perspective, the average rent in this area is about 1200 a month just for an apartment. These guys got a whole two-story house, three beds, four baths, freshly built in a nice neighborhood for $650 a month. I thought it was weird and asked if there was anything wrong with the home, to which she replied that the inspection had come back clear. I didn't think much about it beyond that. 
I started babysitting, and I immediately felt something was off. I have anxiety, so going to new places really puts me in a funk. So I just figured that's what it was, at first. The way the home is set up is important. On the bottom floor, they had a living room, a dining area, and a kitchen with some other rooms. I spent most of my time in the living room, working on things for school while the kids were upstairs playing games or hanging out with friends. While you're in the living room, there's a wall that blocks you from seeing the stairs. Upstairs, there are bedrooms. Immediately off the stairs and above the living room is the parents' room, which was off limits to the kids. Then there was a loft area that looked down over the front door to make a grand foyer feeling. There's a light that can be on which can be seen from downstairs because of the loft. Then the kids' bedrooms were down the hall. So nothing really happened at first that was too mind-boggling. Little noises here and there, knocks on the walls, things being misplaced, lights flickering, but nothing that made me think ghosts. I figured they got what they paid for and my memory was garbage. After a couple of months, things started to pick up and I could no longer blame it on a bad memory or a faulty electrical system. The kids, who were usually very sweet and kind to each other, started becoming noticeably more snappy to everyone, especially Jay. He complained about having nightmares, about somebody standing in his doorway watching him. His parents wouldn't listen, though. Their behavior grew even worse as time went on. It was a weekend, and the parents were going to be gone for a while. The kids were upstairs just doing their thing. I was downstairs in the living room, looking at pizza to order for lunch. Out of nowhere, I hear really loud footsteps coming from above me in the parents' bedroom, thunderous even. Thinking that it was the kids being little dingus meats, I immediately headed upstairs to tell them to get out. But I was greeted with the two kids standing in their doorways, staring at the closed door to their parents' room. The footsteps and bangs were still going on inside. At this point, I thought it was an intruder. I instructed the kids to get into their rooms and lock their doors, and I called emergency and explained the situation. As I stayed on the phone, the footsteps continued to walk around the room. I could hear them moving in different locations. Two officers arrived, so I grabbed the kids and we waited outside. The banging still went on as one of the officers escorted us out. They came out empty-handed and said that there was nothing there, and that there may have been something with the door because the banging stopped as soon as they opened it. I had felt the shaking of the floor moving around the room, so I knew that it wasn't a door, but I guess in my denial I ignored it. I took the kids out for ice cream and tried not to think about it. Another time, the kids and I were sitting in the dining area eating dinner. It was just us three in the house. From the dining area, you could see the light upstairs was on, and it cast a shadow onto the floor. I was making a joke about how I am the only one who knows how to turn a light off around here, and that's when I saw a shadow of a hand from upstairs on the front door. And I think that's when it really started settling down with me, that the house was haunted. The kids didn't see it, and I didn't tell them. I figured it would just add stress that they really didn't need. I told the parents that night when they came home, but they brushed me off, saying they've never experienced anything at all. This continued on for a while. I would experience something, the kids would, but the parents wouldn't believe any of us. It was summer, just after I graduated high school. I remember it vividly because I was awake, reading articles about a huge thing that happened in my town. That's when the banging from upstairs started happening. I was used to it at this point, but what I was not used to was the banging footsteps coming down the stairs. These steps were methodical and menacing. I felt terrible energy in the room and it was cold, despite it being in the middle of summer in the south. I counted the seconds between steps and it was five, every single time. I called out to the kids and told them to stop joking around, but I knew it wasn't them. I was terrified. 
The footsteps stopped at the bottom of the stairs, and I couldn't see who was there. Then I saw an apparition of a little girl. She had brunette hair and a red dress. She looked innocent enough, but the energy in the room was so heavy I almost threw up. She looked at me, and I looked at her, and she didn't move. I thought I was hallucinating, so I started to rub my eyes. But when I finished rubbing them, she was still there, right in front of me. No longer at the foot of the stairs. I never heard her move. In that situation, I couldn't move or do anything. My mind just went to kid brain, and I hid under the blanket I was using. I called the parents crying and told them to come back immediately. When they came, the energy in the room lightened, and I finally came out from under the blanket. She was gone. They asked what was wrong and what happened, and I told them, but of course it didn't matter, because they wouldn't believe me. I then informed them that they needed to find another babysitter, because I would not be returning. I still wonder about the kids. I hope they ended up okay. They moved out of that house at the end of the year, but I'm not sure if what I saw was attached to them or not. I'm still not sure what I saw. Anyway, I still have nightmares about the girl, and it's still a really frightening event for me. About a year and a half ago, my girlfriend and I went down to Ohio Pile State Park. We frequent there, as we live an hour away, and it's one of the best parks within a day's trip for us to hike and swim, mushroom hunt, and explore in general. So one day, we got bored of the normal hiking areas and places that we had already been. So we decided to drive around the back roads, deeper into the woods of the park, no map, just deciding which way to turn when we got to intersections and going from there. We pass a random old cemetery. It couldn't have been a mile or more down the road when we noticed a more dirt-like road, kind of dilapidated, with a chain in front of it so cars couldn't go in. We decided to park the car and go explore the trail in general. There were no signs for no trespassing or anything like that, so we continued on. I'll never forget the eerie feeling I had as soon as we made it onto the trail or road. Just a general sense of, you shouldn't be here. But I don't listen to that feeling. My girlfriend seems intrigued. There's no one at all around. And it seems like a beautiful secluded area. We head back some more and we notice that up a cutoff was an abandoned visitor center so obviously we had to go check it out. This is when things started to get really creepy. We were about a hundred feet away from the building when that alarm in my head that said, you shouldn't be here, intensified immensely. But I was curious about the building still, and my girlfriend at this time is freaking out internally. She wants to leave and she feels uneasy and unwelcome. I want to explore the building because I love abandoned places. In the amount of time it took us to cover that 100 feet, I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent. There were no bugs anymore, no birds, not even the sound of branches swaying in the wind. We get up to the building and my girlfriend is pleading that we go back. I said, let's just take a step in and then we can go. I'm approaching the stairs to the door from the left side, and no joke, straight out of a cheesy horror movie, a bird out of nowhere flies into the window of the building. Not five seconds later, I heard what sounded like either a log or a very large branch cracking on the other side of the building. I'd like to clarify that there was no way it was a small branch or twig. It sounded almost like a tree breaking directly on the other side of the building. I pulled out my pistol and walked quickly backwards, facing the building, and I told my girlfriend to walk as quickly and as quietly as she could back to the car. 
We hopped in and left as quickly as the car would go and drive. I'm still not entirely sure what happened. I know the black bears do reportedly live in the area, though you don't see them too often, and I've never seen one there. But like I said, I suppose it's a possibility, although it doesn't really explain the bird. The second possibility that comes to mind is that it was another human. But the thing that broke didn't sound like a human walking over a branch and breaking it. Like I said, it sounded like a tree snapping when it starts to fall. I've recently gotten into Appalachian folklore and stories, and I've been reading about wendigos, skinwalkers, crawlers, and such. So, for my question, I'm wondering if anybody has ever had a similar experience in Pennsylvania, or in general, and if so, what happened, and what do you think it could have been? My girlfriend and I could never figure out why we felt so afraid. Like I said, it could have been an animal and the bird could have been a coincidence, but we both felt an overwhelming feeling like we shouldn't be there, and it still gives me goosebumps. The woods behind my house have always been odd. About a year ago, I had an encounter with something. To this day, I don't know what, but I know it's back and I know it wants me. Things were quiet. We started to all forget about the mystery woodland encounter from last year. For the most part, my girlfriend and I had moved on from it. That was until two months ago on a cold February morning. My girlfriend discovered that one of our chicken's legs had been snapped in half. I took her to the vet and they were as confused as I was. There was no sign of any attack or any clear indication of who or what had done this. They recommended that I put her down, but I just couldn't do it. I believed that maybe with some rehab in a safe environment, she would heal. I took her home and I put her in the pool house. I went about my days thinking nothing of it. To this day, she hops around on one foot, but she's thriving. Anyway, a week goes by and I come out one morning to find another chicken that had both legs snapped clean in half. I ran over as fast as I could to find a similar situation. There was no sign of attack or any blood to be found. I took her to the vet, and unfortunately, I had to put her down. At this point, I had a chilling feeling as to what might be going on here. I think it's back. The next day, I set up cameras facing those woods. I spent $700 on the best trail cams and the most well-reviewed SD cards I could find, and I was determined to capture it this time. I made a rule that I would check them every day, twice a day, so as not to miss anything. Every time, I would find nothing. Just some cats and my chickens doing animal stuff. Since we found that first chicken, I haven't been able to sleep. I've had night terrors, nightmares, and sleep paralysis almost every night. I kept having a dream about the woods. Something chasing me. Something attacking me or getting lost in there. I'm constantly on edge, and it seems like every noise makes me jump. Yesterday morning, I went to check the cameras. They're gone. They're just gone. I was baffled and in utter disbelief. I hid these cameras so well that not even my girlfriend could find them. And yet, they're gone. I searched everywhere for these things. Every inch of my yard, every nook and cranny of the house and pool house. There is no trace of them. Angry, confused, and upset, I put on my boots, a thick jacket, and I headed into the woods. I was determined to figure out what this thing was and what it wanted with me. Remember now, those woods are dense and thick. Everything is overgrown and muddy, or so I thought. 
I push my way through vines and bushes, around trees and stumps, and I stumbled upon something I wish I had never found. A clearing. I stopped for a moment to try to understand what I was looking at. I wish I could share some kind of satellite view to prove that this clearing can't possibly exist. But then it dawned on me. Where the hell am I? How long have I been walking? Did I go the wrong way? Am I lost? Amongst all my confusion, something catches my eye. It's one of my trail cams smashed on the ground. How the hell did this end up here? It was at this time that I realized how absolutely silent it was. I mean, I could hear my own heart beating. Reality set in and I had the immediate urge to run as fast as I could in the opposite direction. This is where I'm at a complete loss. I took what I thought was maybe a hundred steps through some dense vines and brush, and there I was, at the back of my property. It felt like it took a minute or two of scrambling to get through the thick overgrowth, and I was back. Still absolutely panicking, I continued onward until I got to the back door. I bolted the door and locked myself in the bedroom. I haven't said a word to anyone today. I called out of work, and it's been about 18 hours, and all I can think about is going back in. I'm scared, I can't sleep, and somehow I know that it's watching me through my bedroom window. This story happened to me in the backwoods. It's not paranormal, but that doesn't make it any less terrifying. I work in forestry, and I had a bear that was clearly not afraid of me and did not want to leave me alone. I pulled into our campsite at around 1 a.m. with the truck and trailer, and it's just me out there. I've got to set up two generators, one for the trailer so I don't freeze to death, and one to keep the equipment that we use warm so we can actually use it in the morning and the batteries don't die. I also got there late because I was having truck problems. I had no idea what the cause of them was. It kept dying and then it would be fine, repeating this process over and over. I set up the generator for the trailer and as I was getting the second one out of the truck, I hear a branch snap loudly. I stop and listen, and I can hear more branches snapping and some rustling in the trees. About 50 meters away into the trees, this noise keeps happening, and it's getting closer. I thought it was a person at first, so I yelled, who's there, and got no reply. The noises come right up to the edge of the clearing I'm in, a circle maybe 40 meters across and then they stop. I know whoever it is is just sitting there watching me. After about 15 seconds of me listening hard, half in the truck, I see two eyes appear, and then they rise up to about six feet in the air. I could tell it was a bear by the way it moved, which was actually a relief, because for one, it meant that it wasn't a skinwalker, and two, because I knew that there were only black bears around there and no grizzlies. But I didn't have anything to really defend myself with. No bear spray or gun or bear bangers, anything like that. I yelled at the bear, nothing. I hopped in the truck and pulled the air horn out. It didn't even move. I slowly walked over to the trailer, which was still hooked up to the truck, and grabbed a pot and pan and just started smashing them together at it while yelling. It still didn't move at all. It just stood there, staring at me. It wasn't making any noises either. No huffing or pawing at the ground like I knew bears do if they get upset. But that didn't exactly put my mind at ease, considering that this thing was clearly not afraid of me. Eventually, 
After about 15 minutes of making loud noises and it doing nothing but staring at me, it finally dropped to the ground, turned around, and started to walk away. I waited for about five minutes since I still had to set up the second generator, which I had to bring closer to the bear. Picture a triangle. I was at one corner, the bear was at another, and where I needed to bring the generator was at the third. Right as I pulled the generator out of the truck, I hear branches snapping again, and it's coming back. It came back to the edge of the clearing and did the exact same thing. Stood there, staring at me, and wouldn't leave with all the noise I was making. Again, after another 15 minutes of it sitting there, motionless, it left again and I quietly dragged the generator out, started it, ran back to the other generator, started that one, got in the trailer and shut the door and watched out the window for a while at where it kept coming back to. It never showed up again. Maybe it did after I went to bed, but there was no sign of it in the morning. I know it's not the most insane thing that's ever happened to anybody, but it was intensely disturbing knowing that this thing could easily kill me and wasn't afraid of me and didn't want to leave. It remained so perfectly still, staring at me for such a long time, and I couldn't do anything about it because I had half set up the trailer already and I couldn't leave quickly. Even if I could, there was no guarantee my truck would even start, and I still had a job to do that required me leaving the probably illusionary safety of the truck and go closer to the bear in a way that would mean that if it decided I was worth the trouble, it could get to me faster than I could get back into the truck. I've had other experiences. I had a grizzly charge my truck down at top speed up north, then decided halfway to me that I was a lot bigger than it was and wasn't worth it. Everybody knows bears are fast, but there's a difference between reading the number 50 kilometers per hour or even seeing a video and seeing it in person. An animal that big has no right to move that quickly. It just seems unnatural. I've also heard plenty of very odd noises at night, and the feeling of being watched at night is nearly constant. I stay overnight way in the middle of nowhere alone on a regular basis for my job, and it's very easy to psych yourself out, late at night, alone, with no way to contact anyone except for unreliable GPS text messaging and hours from anything resembling civilization. I've been doing this for years and I'm still not used to it. I've definitely encountered a skinwalker or something like it once, but that's another story for another time and was before I started this job. Anyway, that's my bear that wouldn't leave me alone story. Hope you enjoyed it. In southeast Michigan, there's a mountain bike trail called the DTE Foundation Trail, just north of Chelsea, Michigan. For a mountain biker, it has three major sections, more still under development, including connectors to a larger network, but I digress. Green Loop is easy flow. Came is big climbs, big downhills with jumps, super flow, technical climbs, intermediate. Wind Loop, Long flow with grinding climbs and long downhills. Technical features, intermediate. Sugar loop is fast flow and major speed, but more technical, difficult. The usual flow is you start on the green loop and move on to the big came, then the wind, then the sugar, then back up the loops to the trailhead. There's a Michigan-based blogger named Kai Juno that summed up the creepy part of this forest. This is what Kaijuno wrote. Quote, I know I've made a post about it before, but I can't find it. But the most like bone chilling thing you can ever experience is the silence when you're walking in the woods. Like it's the woods. There's always birds and bugs and frogs and stuff, but 
Sometimes it will just go completely dead silent. Sometimes it feels like even the breeze stops, like the animals can sense a predator nearby that's even bigger and scarier than you. So what does this mountain bike trail system have to do with the silence? The west side of the wind loop. Things just happen there. I've been to DTE so many times and the uneasy feeling never goes away on the west side of the wind. I'll pass riders who have taken some bad falls and require a medevac. There's a spot where the forest looks pretty open, but it's quiet. Unless there's a storm moving through the area, you don't hear a thing. This section is about 500 to 600 feet directly south of the intersection of Gilnan Drive and Sugarloaf Lake Road. There used to be a trail that branched off to the left, and after a tree fell over, nobody ever opened it back up. There's always this heavy musk in that area specifically. I know the smell of deer, and it isn't to that. Something else lives in that area, and it creeps me out. Part of me thinks it's a mountain lion, but those sightings are super rare and have been mostly a little bit more west or in the upper peninsula. The most perplexing thing is that this is really close to Sugarloaf Lake and there are some people living out there, so there shouldn't be a reason for this unease. I'm not the only person that's felt it, but yeah, there's something really not right with the forest there. Last night, my boyfriend and I were downstairs. It's a raised ranch style home. And we were just watching a movie and he went up to the window to crack it for some fresh air. We live in the Northeast and a couple of days ago, we got a good amount of snow. Now we do live in an area where wildlife is fairly common. He stood at the window and just stopped what he was doing in a complete stare. I asked, and babe, what's going on? He said, you have to come here and look at this. I got up off the couch and made my way to the window. We saw footprints and nothing like I have ever seen before. I've grown up in the woods my entire life. The men in my family are big into hunting. They're pretty big outdoorsmen. I can pretty much look at any track and know what it is. The back tracks looked like deer or rabbit, and the front ones looked like some type of bird, like a turkey, for example. The space in between them was fairly large. Whatever it was had a pretty big stride. Whatever it was looked like it had been circling the window, then to the side of the house, which our bedroom window is right above that. Also, where a cherry tree is, there's a second set of prints it looked like something started walking from the tree and just stopped. My first thought was, okay, something was just sniffing around and turned around. Well, there are no tracks back. They just completely stop. I've looked up every single possible animal that it could be, and absolutely nothing I've been able to find matches. This morning, my boyfriend went out there and looked around. My dog was with him. And as he was sniffing around, his fur was up, on high alert. He's not unfamiliar with wildlife, and this is probably the third time in his whole life that I've ever seen his fur go up like that. He said that the tracks didn't make any sense at all, that they appeared and just disappeared, and that there was no distinct pattern to them whatsoever. I know what you might be thinking. Did the snow cover them up? Maybe the wind covered the rest. We haven't had any more snow, and the snow that we do have is fairly hard. I can see my dog's tracks perfectly. Two nights ago, when these footprints could have been left, I was watching a movie down there scrolling through Reddit. I had this really weird feeling that came over me, like I was being watched. I literally pulled the blinds shut. A couple of hours later, I could hear this bush start moving outside. 
I figured it was just the wind or an animal. There's this big fat blue jay who does have a nest in there. But then I started to hear this faint clicking noise. This is the second time that I've heard that noise. The last time was when I lived two hours away, again in the middle of nowhere, and I was walking my dog at night. It made me physically ill. I figured I was just being paranoid. I was reading creepy stuff on Reddit, so I calmed myself down, telling myself that it was all in my head. We have cameras, but nothing on that side of the house, and there was nothing on any of my cameras. If anybody knows what these footprints might be, if it is in fact an animal, that would be great. I'm actually kind of scared. For the last three days, I've been having really bad anxiety. I just can't pinpoint it. I just feel like something is wrong or something bad is going to happen. My internal radar is going off in every possible way, kind of like a gut feeling. But like I said, I just can't put my finger on it. Something just feels incredibly off. I was around 12 when I had gotten a babysitting job with a family across town. This family was new to the area and just recently bought the house next to my best friend's place. My first day over was to get familiar with the kids and the house. The parents stayed and evaluated me and of course answered any questions I had. I spent my time playing and keeping the children occupied. A boy named Devin, age 4, and a girl named Cameron, age 7, so I had my work cut out for me. Cameron wanted me to go to her room so she could show me her toys. I followed her up the two flights of stairs, but as we came to the top of the stairs, I felt strangely lightheaded and the hair on my arms rose up. I had an intense feeling of being watched, like there was someone else up there with us. I tried to ignore this sensation and continued with my duties of finding Cameron's favorite doll so we could go back downstairs. At the end of the day, it was decided that I was a good match and I was to come back on Saturday morning. As I headed home, I couldn't shake that feeling that I had gotten upstairs. I told myself, nah, it's nothing, and I brushed it off to just being in a new place with unfamiliar surroundings. That Saturday morning, I showed up to a busy home as the parents tried to get out the door and show me the last minute things I needed for the day ahead. The kids were up in their PJs eating breakfast and already talking to me about all the fun things they wanted to do today. After the parents left, I ushered the kids off to get changed. As I was cleaning up the breakfast dishes, I heard a loud bang coming from the dining room. I ran into the room and found one of the false ceiling tiles had fallen from its place. Puzzled, I tried to put it back up, but it was not an easy task. After some struggling, I managed to fit it back in. I thought, how could this thing have fallen out by itself? The day went on and now it's close to lunchtime. The kids are watching TV and I'm in the kitchen making something for lunch when again I hear a loud bang coming from the dining area. I look and sure enough that tile has come out again. This time I leave it for the parents to see when they get home. I figured maybe they could fix it. Now the kids wanted to play hide and seek. We started off with Cameron seeking and myself and Devin hiding. As Cameron started to count we scurried around trying to find the best hiding place. I found the downstairs bathroom to be the best place for me. It was easy enough for Cameron to find me, and I hid Devin close to me so I could keep an eye on him. As I entered the bathroom, I closed the door quietly behind me. I walked a few steps into the room and was now facing the mirror. As I was looking at my reflection, I also noticed something behind me, moving. It was the closet door directly behind me, slowly opening. The closet door opened halfway, 
and then slowly closed again on its own. I had that same feeling come over me, the one that I had when I was upstairs on my first day. Wide-eyed with fear, I turned the bathroom door and ran out. All I could think was, what just happened? I was really starting to worry that this house was haunted, and I now had every horror movie I ever watched playing through my head. Now I'm finding that I'm really uncomfortable, but I decide that it's best to just keep occupied. I break out a board game for us to play in the living room floor. Hungry Hungry Hippo, I think it was. We were playing for around 20 minutes before I noticed something out of the corner of my eye, moving. I turned my head to see what it was. A child's shoe was tumbling across the floor, all by itself. The kid stopped and watched in utter confusion. I was in disbelief. Cameron let out a scream and she ran for the door. I grabbed Devin and followed. We went to my friend's house next door and told her mom everything. I'm not sure if she believed me, but we stayed over there until the parents got home. When they showed up, we told them what we saw. I don't think they believed me either. I showed the panel that had fallen out, apparently it's been an issue since they moved in. And as for the rest of my accounts, they chalked it up to a child's excessive imagination. I know what I saw and what I felt. I wasn't imagining. I later found out a bit of history about the house. Apparently, a man died in that house of a heart attack upstairs in a room above the dining room, right above where the panel kept falling out. Sometimes I think it was his spirit still in that house. Maybe he was just trying to play with us. This event occurred in early fall of 1971 or 1972. I'm not sure what jogged this memory, but it's probably something to do with reading a lot of off-the-grid weirdness on Reddit. Also, some of the details are a bit gray, but the gist of the story begins here. I grew up in the Philly suburbs. The Boy Scouts were popular then, and I was quite active, especially with camping. One of the go-to areas was the New Jersey Pine Barrens, especially along the Wading River and Bass River State Forest. Our patrol was on a weekend camping trip at the South Shore Campground. Lots of pine breaks, but even more swamps and bogs and boggy swamps and other things that were similar to swamps and bogs. Our patrol probably seven of us plus one guy's dad who drove us, was assigned a three-sided shelter. The front of the shelter opened to, you guessed it, the swamp. If you walked 11 feet from the front of the shelter, you'd be standing ankle deep in water. Then it just got deeper and darker and boggier from there. We mucked about on Saturday until late afternoon, made our way back to the shelter cooked dinner and just chilled out until it got dark. And it was crazy dark. No other campers around, just the light of our slowly dying fire. We begin to hear a slow splashing sound coming from the swamp, maybe 100 feet out from our fire. One of the guys yelled something toward the sound and everything went quiet. A minute later, the splashing began again, but slower and more methodical. This time it was within 15 feet of the fire, but it was out of the fire's light. None of us were really concerned. We were all seasoned campers and figured that it was just a deer or a raccoon looking to score an easy meal. Suddenly, the walking became a slow, steady sloshing. This perked us up, wondering if this thing may suddenly decide to rush us. Our patrol leader jumped up, grabbed his flashlight, and pointed it toward the noise. His light hit something, and he yelled, It's a man! and ran to the swamp burn. 
I saw a brief flash of red flannel in the flashlight beam and then heard fast splashing back into the swamp. The splashing eventually faded out in the darkness. So what did we do? We tried to figure out what the hell just happened, then crawled into our sleeping bags and somehow fell asleep. Nothing else did happen, and we went home the next day as scheduled. We had lots of stories about what it might have been, if it was a real person, if it was a ghost. Thinking back on it now, it must have been a piney, a local who knew the area really well. This man had to navigate through some serious and dangerous swamps to come check us out though, so it's still pretty creepy, even if it was just a man. The pines can be great and also eerie, and that weekend was both. I've had a few experiences throughout my life, but this one tends to stand out. I was about 14 and I had been babysitting for a few couples for about three years already. Two of the couples were close friends and I would end up babysitting for both sets of their children. One had two and one had three children, ranging from 18 months to 10 years old. This particular night, I asked a friend of mine to assist so I do have a witness. The home we were in was in an older, beautiful two-story home with a full basement in a nice part of Tulsa around Swan Lake. The kids got rowdy when bedtime was mentioned, which is why I had my friend. They were in an upstairs room, the baby's room, jumping and laughing, and all of a sudden we heard three incredibly loud bangs from near the window on the second floor. Upon hearing this, I called out, and I told the kids that that was enough, having thought that it was one of them. It was then that I noticed that they were all frozen in their tracks, looking from the window to us. And one of them finally said, we didn't do it. No one had been by the window. It wasn't until a few years ago that I would mention this part when I told the story because I really didn't want to believe what I saw when I looked out. But there were two red eyes looking into the room from outside. I grabbed the baby and we nearly ran over each other getting out of the room and downstairs. My friend and I ran into the kitchen and grabbed steak knives. We were young and panicked and we huddled in the living room. First, we heard a loud crash then we heard something with loud, heavy steps, just pacing back and forth. The home had original hardwood floors, so it creaked. I had called my parents who were about 10 minutes away, no cell phones then, and I told them that there was someone in the house. My parents came and my dad went upstairs, my friend and I close behind. Of course, there was no one, but the weird thing we did notice was that the bedroom door to the right of the top stairs was open. We went in and the closet door was open and there was a curtain which was down, which had covered a very small window, about 18 by 12 inches, and that window was open. There were no trees, no ladders, no gables, no way to access this back side of the house upstairs, especially through that window. When the parents came home, we had told them what happened, and I proceeded to mention that I probably would not be comfortable babysitting there again. The next morning, my mom mentioned that she had heard about a 15-year-old boy who had lived with his stepmother. He had hung himself in that house but she didn't want to tell me because she didn't want me to be scared or imagine things. Thanks, Mom. Having heard this, it made me remember being in this house during previous times that I had babysat and other situations that occurred. One, the home had window units, and in the summertime, I found that there was always a cool breeze from the bottom to the top stair. 
I would always sit there and do my homework after the kids went to bed. At the top and bottom of the stairs, though, at least once you pass those points, it would be really hot and humid. Two, the downstairs had the living room back to a wall and stairs to the kitchen. I would sit on a settee with my back to the stairs, doing my homework, and suddenly feel somebody behind me. It always felt like it was a male presence, and I thought it was the father trying to sneak up and surprise me. I mean, I could hear his breathing and all. I would steel myself so that I wouldn't jump when he tried to surprise me, but then nothing would happen, and I would jerk around and see that nobody was there. Then I would just turn on the TV or something to occupy my mind, being a bit creeped out. Number three. This home has sold several times over the years. One time when I had been visiting town several years later, I had moved out of state, there was a midnight garage sale. I had to stop and talk to the current owners. Either them or the next owners ended up building a tall brick fence around the property, seemingly due to others knowing about this house and wanting to come and visit the haunted house. Finally, during another visit with an old boyfriend, we drove by and they were having an open house for sale again. We stopped and we were invited to go through. The home had been completely remodeled, beautiful with a decked out full basement. While we were ascending the stairs to the second floor, I was explaining to the agent and my friend that during the time that I had babysat in the home and during several visits thereafter, the weirdest thing was that there was approximately six locks on the attic door from the hallway, and I had never gone into the attic, because obviously. Right as I finished my story, we looked up, and even after all the different renovations of the home, the locks were still on that attic door. Mind you, at this time, it had been at least 20 years since I had babysat there makes me wonder what they realized they needed to keep in all these years. I did finally open the door. The hair was straight up on my neck. There were about five steps and plywood covering the rest. I opened the boards and it was just a room with some plywood on the floor, not really built out at all, but the energy was thick. I don't exactly know what happened in that home other than the one incident but it has stayed with me throughout the years. I felt for many years that there was something looking out at me every time I passed that home. The front faced a busy street and was near to the home that I was raised in and still visited. I still drive by every time I'm in town and I still feel like there's something there. My friends and I are on our way from Chicago back to our home in Evansville, Indiana. As such, we have to drive through the Midwestern country to get there. Pitch black highways surrounded by trees and cornfields. About four hours away from home, my friend screams and I look up. We hit a deer going 50. The poor guy bounced off the front end and was probably dead on impact. We come to a stop and commiserate, call our parents, etc. We're stranded on a quiet highway in the middle of nowhere, trees to our right and a few houses a bit far off to our left, all surrounded by cornfields, of course. My friend is standing outside surveying the damage when we hear a scream, a man's scream, a bit far off to our left. My other friend and I look at each other, wide-eyed, a few minutes pass and we hear one again. I make a joke about skinwalkers and my friend gets back in the car. A bit later, after calling 911, we heard another scream, a woman this time, and it seemed closer. We're waiting on the deputy and nervously joking about whether it's skinwalkers or just crazy woodland people. And my friend facing the trees suddenly laughs nervously and rolls up the window. 
She goes, I just heard clicking noises outside my window and I'm rolling it up because I'm not going to pretend like I just didn't hear that. I know that clicking noises are often a thing with skinwalker stories and things like that. We're not really sure what happened. We think maybe something was trying to lure us out into the woods, but we didn't go, obviously. Obviously we survived too, but I don't think any of us are going to forget that experience anytime soon. For some background, I'm 23 and I have lived in the country all my life, growing up on the east side of Lake Winnipeg and moving to the west side as a teenager. This story takes place when I was 17 and it's true. A few years after my family moved, I started dating my boyfriend at the time. I lived within the small town, but my boyfriend lived about 15 minutes out surrounded by woods. His only neighbor was about a mile down. I'm using miles because country roads here are done in mile sections, not kilometers. On a September night, I was at his house watching movies and things like that. I wanted to go out for a cigarette at about 2 a.m. He said he didn't want one, but for some reason, I felt scared to go outside by myself, probably because I was really tired and kind of out of it. So I made him come out with me anyway. We go out onto the front deck in the dark. He's looking at his phone. I'm smoking and enjoying that crisp fall air. Then I heard this distant cry come from the direction of the neighbor's house. It kind of sounded like it could be a dog or a coyote. I asked my boyfriend what he thought it was, to which he replied he thought it was the neighbor's dog. We were both leaning against the house, listening to it and we noticed that it was slowly getting louder, as though it was getting closer. Then it changed in pitch and tone dramatically and became guttural. It sounded something like a human screeching for their life, but it definitely wasn't human. The type of scream that just immediately makes you feel sick to your stomach and terrified. My blood turned to ice the back of my neck was prickling and we both just froze. We were just staring at each other, looking around and then back to each other, but our feet would move. I don't think I can even fully explain what it sounded like. Again, I've lived in the country all my life. This didn't sound like any wildlife that I have ever heard of. I know people's first response is that cougars and coyotes and foxes can sound like people, but I know firsthand what those calls sound like, and this wasn't that. We listened to that awful sound getting closer and louder for probably two minutes before my boyfriend grabbed my arm and rushed inside. We never lock our doors where I'm from, but damn, did we lock every door and window in the house that night. We jumped into bed, freaking out, trying to make sense of what the heck that was. And we could still somewhat hear it, even from where we were inside. We laid there silently for about 10 minutes. And then out of nowhere, it just stopped. Obviously, we didn't sleep much. The next day, we drove past the neighbor's house and dog was fine, just chilling in the driveway. Nothing was out of the ordinary and it never happened again. To this day, that sound freaks me out. <laughs> 